to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the proposed appropriation of $95 million for the reconstruction and renovation of the John F. Kennedy School and to authorize the issuance of bonds, notes, or temporary notes in an amount not to exceed $35,500,000 with the balance funded by grants and other available funds. And may we have roll call, please. Councillor Arnone. Here. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Falk. Mayor Copen. Here. Deputy Mayor Lee. Councillor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Suzak. Here. We have eight members present who are absent. The following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current Friday, August 25th, 2017, Town of Enfield Legal Notice Public Hearing. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Tuesday, September 5th, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. to allow interested citizens an opportunity to, exp to express their opinions regarding the proposed appropriation of $95 million for the reconstruction and renovation of the John F. Kennedy School and to authorize the issuance of bonds, notes, or temporary notes in an amount not to exceed $35,500,000 with the balance funded by grants and other available funds. Ground rules for the public hearing are as follows. One, there is no time limit, but I ask that each person not take up too much time so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. Two, after each person who desires has had one chance to speak, I shall permit those individuals who desire a second chance. Three, after those individuals who desire to speak a second time, I shall permit those individuals who desire a third, fourth, et cetera time. And four, please refrain from the use of personalities. So Brian, do we have uh, any framing of uh, the referendum or do you wanna go right into the public hearing? Um, it was my thought that we could go right into the public hearing, sir, and then we can address any issues or concerns that come up uh, okay. at the pleasure of council. Very good, so at this time, is there anyone in the audience wishing to address the council on this public hearing? Jack. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. Uh, I'm here to speak in against the $95 million. School, the school budget goes up each year while students are declining every year on an average of 200 per year. The school budget goes up every year even though we close schools. People are exiting Connecticut faster than taxes can fill the void. Hey, Jack, can you do me a favor? Just see if you can pull that microphone a little. Is it on? I think it is. The light is the red on, Red light's right? on, yeah. Okay. Couldn't hear me? We, w we weren't getting the... No, it wasn't we... loud at all. But go ahead. Yeah. You don't want me to start over? That's up to you. I'm, I'm saying I'm here to vote against the $95 million dollars and the school budget goes up every year while students are declining every year on an average of 200 students for the last 17 years. Uh, school budget goes up every year even though we close schools. People are exiting Connecticut faster than taxes can fill the void. Voters are being told local taxes will only go up one half mil. What about the state? States expected the state. Uh, uh, the state is uh, broke. They can't support allocations by eight million dollars. How will they support grants of sixty-five million with a declining bond rating? Voters should know. Once we accept grant funds for schools, they will fill the empty seats by busing in students. Close JFK and move to Fermi. This will save dollars and utilize a school we have spent millions on. 
Connecticut and, and Enfield have a spending problem, not a revenue problem? Demography people have, don't have a good future prospect for Enfield. Please live within the revenue like most of the rest of us taxpayers. I don't understand because we built um, a magnet school for less than what you want to spend to refurbish as new JFK. So it would seem to me it would be cheaper to bulldoze it down and build new. I'm not advocating that, but when you look at the dollars and you look at the, the mistakes that were made even at Enfield High, I don't know yet whether they've corrected the heating and air conditioning ductwork, but you never hear anything said about that. Um, but there are, there are consequences to going into a thing like this where they're spending those kinds of dollars uh, that we don't have. And if, if, if we continue on this path, the people won't be able to afford what we've got now. The, the declining population and the declining uh, students are a great indication of that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's nice to say you want all of these things, but I think if, if, if at all that we do something there, we have to do it at a minimum amount and whatever it takes with our own funding, not state funding. State funding, my taxes, I've been retired 17 years and my state taxes are going up every year since I've been retired. So I don't know, people f treat state tax or revenue like it's free. It isn't free. It costs me more than, than uh, I can afford. So those, those are the kind of decisions. And, and I've said enough, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council on this public hearing? Anyone else? Come on up. Lucian Lafay, 54 Kimberly Drive, Enfield. I'm just curious how this is going to affect our the bonding within the town, because I know we've gone out and we've bonded. You know, roads 2015, the new high school, are there the sewer plant? Are there bonding issues that are getting paid up before we bond for a new school? And is this going to blow our bonding up by the full $35 million? Have we put something to bed, a bonding issue that's been paid for? Because I know in the past, as things have closed up, the, the town has gone into to look for more, more bonding of money. And I was just curious how this affects the, the issue of total bonding for the town how much we've got out there in bonding. So after round one, we'll have, uh, that question's been asked before, and okay. we'll have uh, Brian uh, get you that answer. Yes, sir. Bill Queter. 87 Steel Road, Enfield. My concern that I have, I have concerns other than the fact that the school may need a lot of work to be done. Uh, the maintenance has not been too great, but that's, a, that's another subject. But I'm speaking tonight about the needs or the desires concerning our middle school, JFK. And speaking on this proposal to refurbish the school, it appears that the matter is being rushed. Why is this justifiable? Racing to get on a municipal ballot is not a very good reason. Another co concern of mine deals with the ability of or the lack thereof for the state to finance million dollar projects when our elected officials cannot come up with a budget let alone multi-millions for bonding. This proposal appears to be another case of political business as usual. We can't afford to do business as usual, especially at this time. Even though the state's fiscally deteriorating, 
a long road to bankruptcy, it looks like. We hope not. But another concern is allowing local financing and budgeting to deteriorate. And as Jack just said to the speakers back, he's talking in terms of what's happening to our own budget and our own ability to raise taxes. A number of towns, including Enfield, will have to face reality in the near future due to the blindly following a, a variety of policies promulgated by the towns and the state. The results will show up in the areas of benefits and personnel retention and is already happening in some towns. It's already started. And it will be a serious concern for all the taxpayers. So could we end up with costly plan preparation, which would be on a docket for sure. It's gonna cost a lot of money to do the plans for this school. And only then are we gonna have, the, know if we have the financing to do it, to do the construction. And also to pay for the plans. So if one does not have the money you cannot spend it. And we don't have it. The state does not have it. It's very obvious, and I think a lot of people are addressing this issue, and a lot of people in the town and in the state are very much concerned about it. So we, if we're going to go, if the, if the council decides to go ahead and put this on the ballot, I would hope that they could put some conditions on it to prevent us from getting burned. And that's about the size of it. It's something that we, we don't really able to afford to do the, what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Public hearing, anyone in the audience wishing to address the council on this public hearing? Yes. Good evening, uh, Bethany Olette, 24 Betty Road. Uh, one thing I would like to know is we have some issues at JFK and health concerns and obviously our infrastructure throughout town, not just our schools, um, hasn't been a priority and I know we're trying to make it a priority. So there has to be costs involved to get us there. What are those costs gonna be to us um, to get us there with JFK in relationship to a renovate is new with the hope of getting grant money. Are we gonna put a Band-Aid on it for close to the same amount of money we'd be investing um, to renovate as new and to give our school system um, the facility that it really needs and to help maintain the value of our town by having updated infrastructure. Thank you, Bethany. Vinny? Hello, my name is Vinny Westlisa, 12 Deer Run. Um, and for full disclosure, I'm part of the JFK referendum. I was one of the committee members. Um, as a lot of people know, I have not been a big opponent of using JFK over Fermi. And by now, that's probably no secret. And uh, I joined this committee to find out if we're going to use this school, how can we make this possibly the best solution we can for our, our, our students? And we looked at this school as in a couple different ways. One is renovation, one is renovation to new. And we looked at it as um, what's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and what's going to be the biggest long-term solution. My goal starting this committee was going to be if we're going to renovate JFK, then we're going to make this the best school possible. And from what the committee found out and, and from all the research we did is the only way to make this school the best school possible was to do renovate to new. It's expensive. It's extremely expensive. It's a big burden on the town to be able to pick up these expenses. But if we're looking at this as a, uh, a community, um, the best way to expand and to improve our community is through our school system. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have adequate facilities for our students. And by doing what we're doing now, this is guaranteed that our students are going to have an adequate facility 
that gives them the best opportunity to increase their education and progress through those higher education schools um, because we're giving them the facility that they deserve. Um, I, for one, will be supporting this, this referendum, and uh, it goes against a lot of things that I've been talking about throughout the years, or at least the last couple years. But as a resident, I am not forgetting how we got to this point. We got to this point on a decision that I feel that was kind of jammed on our town and wasn't really duly, no, a lot of due diligence wasn't done in order to come up with the best solution. We're never going to know as a town if Fermi was the best solution or not. We're never going to know if Fermi was the cheapest solution or not because we didn't do the work necessary to find that solution out. The leadership committee came up with a report that they talked about. From all my research, from that, re from prior to this and from all my research on this committee, this report's crap. There's nothing in it that's usable in order to find out what school was the best. And I realize that. And I am going to go to the, the, the voting booth and I'm going to support this re referendum, but I'm also going to look at how we got to this point. And we need to hold our politicians accountable for not doing due diligence. This may not be the cheapest solution, but it's our only solution at this point. And if we forego this opportunity, we may not have this opportunity again with the state funding. Budgets are going to be tight, and the state next year is most likely not going to offer 70% or at all uh, reimbursement. So I'm going to the booth with mixed emotions voting for this. I know that what we're doing here and what the school is now, it's going to be their best long-term solution that we have. And it's the, only, it's the only solution we have. And I'm putting that two years of past behind me and looking to the future of Enfield. And I think right now this is the, the best decision we can make for our town. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Public hearing. Anyone in the audience wishing for the first time to address the council? Anyone else? Mr. Rutledge? Uh, good evening, Chris Rutledge, 7 Victory Street. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. I know it was a month ago when I came up here to present the JFK pre-referendum committee's final report. And um, I just had a few comments. Um, I want to thank the people that have come up. I think the town has definitely benefited by hearing feedback from both sides of any argument. And it also gives us a chance to communicate and try and help each other better understand um, the side that each other is on. Um, once again, I just want to thank every member of the JFK Referendum Committee. This was certainly not a proposal that was rushed into. We worked on it for oh, well over, over a year. Um, we went through a number of different designs, number of different schematics, we reviewed space program templates, all sorts of reports to come up with the solution that Mr. Nardi and I, who's also in the audience, presented to you um, about a month ago. Um, really just two big points I think I want to bring up, and those are uh, in regards to buildings and also as to costs. Um, yes, there's a $95 million price tag on it. Yes, we were able to qualify for a 70 plus percent reimbursement rate to drop the town's liability on it. One thing to consider is that these are, my understanding is that these are basically, a, this re reimbursement comes from a pool of funds that are distributed to various school projects across the state some town is going to get them. Frankly, I'd much rather see those funds stay here in Enfield so that we can ben so it can benefit our school system and so that we can rebuild some of these schools, particularly JFK, because as the committee saw, it's certainly in need. Um, I know there's obviously concerns at the, uh, of what's going on at the state level. Um, however, we did, one of the reasons we did push to get this done, or at least the main part of the proposal done by the end of June, was so that we would qualify for that reimbursement rate because that was in the best interests of the town and to the taxpayers. Um, as to the issue of buildings and maintenance, the, the consultants that we had for the committee, I think on multiple occasions, they indicated that the building has actually been fairly well maintained. But just, just like an old car, you know, you can change its oil every 3,000 miles, you can rotate the tires, you can do all the maintenance. Eventually, it's going to need to be replaced. And I know that if I was going to buy a car and I knew that I could spend $10,000 on a new one, but maybe 10 or 20% more and have a brand new one with a full warranty and everything that I need, I'd probably go for the brand new car that had everything I needed, even though it costs just a little bit more because it's a better long-term solution. Um, I know sometimes that can be more expensive, 
but you know with other buildings in town and i've seen you know the work some of you folks donna in particular have done on the joint facilities committee the buildings are going to need to be addressed and this is the time for us to address the jfk building and get it fixed up so it meets the needs of the students um, not just for today not tomorrow but for future generations as well thank you very much thank you chris anyone else in the audience wishing to address the council on this public hearing for the first time all right um brian's in the aisle but i'm going to ask brian there are a couple questions that were raised if you could um you know, lucian had a question regarding uh the impact on our overall bonding and payment and payback bethany had a question on pcb costs and renovate as new versus other okay um to those questions um i will address them in the order that i have the information and i, I apologize that's what i've asked uh, paul russell to go uh, get with respect to the uh, the final upgrade costs um on the bonding issue um how would this particular uh, project affect the town's ability to bond or the town's bond rating in the future. Uh, we just actually had an S&P bond rating uh, for the issuance of bonds related to uh, the roads project to the high school and uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, during this uh, evaluation process, the review and evaluation process for this rating, we did disclose to um, the firm uh, S&P that we did intend uh, that there are, shouldn't say that we intended, but there was a possibility that the town would bond for this particular project. Total cost of the project we estimated at the time to be 95 million. Our total long-term obligation we estimated to be 35 million. Based on that information that we presented, we still came back with a rating of double A. Um, our short term was um, SP1 plus, which is. Um, uh, the bands, the bond anticipation notes. So those are uh, short-term bond issuances. But the long-term notes, we came back at AA stable, uh, which is where we started um, in the process to begin with. The evaluation report, which was provided to us by S&P, um, did comment on the future outlook of the town and how the town's bond rating could be affected. Quote, the downside scenario. We could lower the rating if the town is unable to balance the town's revenues and expenditures or if the lower than budgeted state aid pressures the town uh, pressures the town finances resulting in lower budgetary performance and or flexibility. The upside scenario, quote, we could raise the rating if Enfield's budget flexibility and performance improve while the town maintains its current debt and contingent liability profiles and economic metrics improve. So the ratings firms aren't concerned with the town adding additional debt. The rating agency is concerned about the town's ability to be responsive to its operating needs. So it is not uncommon for communities who bond to have scheduled draws from their fund balance or from their savings account. The schedule draws are not the concern to the rating agencies. It's when those draws become unscheduled or become continuously larger than the schedule draw. So that is a concern um, that is addressed. But again, it has nothing to do with the fact that we are taking on or we could be taking on this additional debt. Um, with respect to the issue of um, the PCB management matters, what would it cost to address the PCB issues? In the short term, uh, the estimate that we have currently is about 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars to address all of the uh, PCB materials that exist within the school at this time. So that is based on the information we had up until about a week, week and a half ago. Um, we did get some updated soil samples. I'm not yet sure um, what information has uh, come in from um, uh, Fuss and O'Neill, who was our consultant on that, on any remediation requirements or cost estimates. But for the internal facility uh, itself, uh, the estimate was again um, 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars. Uh, for the broader sense of the structure, 
Um, you know, obviously to uh, the chairman's point that uh, and some other comments that even though you may take care of the facility as best you can, that facility is eventually going to wear out being the age that it is. Uh, when we review the JFK numbers uh, that were prepared as part of the SBS study, the total, uh, the total JFK estimated cost was, let's see, let me get to the right page here. The total estimated cost for JFK under this project was $15.3 million, and that number is 2015. So you're looking at 6% more or so based on um, escalators. So, um, and that's just to fix what's there, not to improve, you know, with any great significance. So there is a measure of, um, you know, there is a measure of, I guess, less cost uh, based on the alternatives that we know about to directly remediate the PCB issues um, and then again to fix what was directly identified in the SBS study um, from 2015. So I think those are the questions that were presented in the first series of comments uh, and I'll be more than happy to answer any other items that I might have missed as a result. All right, so we'll go to round two and Jack, you had your hand up. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. I don't know what it is that people don't understand about the state aid and the fact that if we don't get state aid, we're not getting three to eight million is the threat right now of, of allocations back to the town. So we're willing to enter in to a 60 some odd million dollars of more aid from, from grant money from the state without a, a solid way of knowing that we're actually going to get that money and we're going to enter into that debt. Who does it then fall on if the state reneges? And in the past, we've had 68 kids bust into JFK in the past from, from out of town. And that was because of empty seats. So if we, if we wind up, and, and, and these people that talk about, well, if we don't take it as a town, somebody else will get it, that's nonsense. That's greed. If, you, if, you, if you're willing to take all of the responsibility of, of having empty seats and, and the grant money would, would require us then to take on these other students, at whose cost? We're the ones paying the taxes for the, for the school budget. So I don't understand it. I don't, it, it would be like if you, if you know that your job is going to come to an end within the next three months and yet you go out and buy a new house or a new car. You don't do that. I just don't understand it. I, I, I guess I, I just, to, for you people to be able to balance the budget and make things whole in this town and have a, have a, a good school system, which I believe we do have, um, we need to not spend money that we don't have. And, and have more people exiting town. Values of homes don't go up when they <coughs> exit, they go down. The house sales, if you look at the, the house sales in the newspaper, when they report every month, they report another town, and the sales are up, but the values are down. So, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council on this public hearing for a second time mr neville tim neville 25 jewel street enfield <clears throat> i wasn't going to speak but and i can't speak as a you know just as a, a transparency I, i've been on the uh, the uh, committee um, but I'm also on the uh, facilities committee, of which I've spent the most time, along with uh, Donna and, and, and Liz and, and, uh, and a few others. Um, 
and I guess I have a couple of questions. I, I can't speak in favor or against it, but I, I, I think the process that they went through was good, as Vinny had said, and I think they, they did a lot of good work in terms of coming up with it. Um, but my concern is, if we don't do this, who pays? Because there's a number of things in there that we've all looked at on the facilities committee that have to be done. They were laid out in the, is it the SBS report? Just, I always get the acronym wrong, I, I apologize. But they've, they, they've gone to the end of the useful life. We're talking about roofs, we're talking about boilers, we're talking about HVAC systems, we're talking about all kinds of stuff, and we're also talking about PCBs. If, if this doesn't pass, how does it get paid? Uh, how do we do it? Because the PCBs and, and, and uh, things like roofs and, and boilers and HVAC, they, it's like on your house. You have to fix them when, when they're at the end of their useful life. Um, if we don't do it this way, um, how do we do it? I think we're restricted to somewhere around $600,000 by charter that we can spend on any given project a year. If I'm wrong on that, Scott, please correct me. Um, and so I don't think you can do roofs that way. I've been to three different roofs at JFK over the course of my tenure there. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very expensive process to get it done. So I'd like to hear how we would go about doing that if we don't do that. Plus, I think we've all been agonizing over how we get a good plan together for the town on how to deal with facilities issues. It's not just Enfield that has it. I think it's every town probably in the state, and the state has their own stuff, and the federal government has theirs. But the only thing we can control is what we do here in Enfield. And I think the committee, to their credit, has been looking at it and saying, how do we put this together? We've got ourselves in a hole here. We've got a lot of projects that have to get done, tens of millions of dollars that's beyond the JFK stuff. How do we deal with that in a reasonable and financially responsible way for the citizens? And then how do we make us not get into that position again? Okay, and I, and I think that, that's, that's a critical point. So I guess my question is, if this doesn't go through, what, what are our options? And what does that cost? Because I, I think the chairman brought out that this was pushed through in June because we were getting a very, very favorable rate of reimbursement. I think it was 70 or 71 percent. Given the state of the state and, and all the word I think we've been getting from the state is that in a, after this time, when they reset the rates, we would not get anywhere, anywhere near that favorable reimbursement. So I'd like to hear what our options are. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Tim. Anyone else for this public hearing? Anyone else? So, and I, Brian, I think I can field the question from uh, from Tim. So, if if the referendum does not, if the referendum moves to the ballot in November and it does not pass, um, any work that needs to be done at JFK, whether it's just the PCBs or uh, the renovations that Brian mentioned uh, a couple minutes earlier, all require uh, referendum approval. So what it would take is a council and a board of ed to get together and say, okay, what are our next steps? So it's always going to be through referendum because our, our limit is in the neighborhood of $550,000 in any one given fiscal year that you can spend on a project, and so that requires referendum. Um, so, and if, if we take Brian's numbers of that 15 to 16 million from 2015 and we do an escalator on it of 6%, you know, you're now at 16 plus million and then the PCBs, you, you would need to really tack on top of it. So you're at an 18 to $20 million project that doesn't receive renovation from, uh, or doesn't receive reimbursement from the state of Connecticut. Um, and, and so that is the, the minimum that may have been identified. And that's, again, that was 15. So people would have to get together and say, okay, what is the bare minimum that would need to be done? And what would those costs be? But it, it would require, uh, any type of work would require referendum. So even, even on the PCB issue, the PCB issue is part of uh, the November referendum. So it would be addressed uh, through that process. Um, the, the major work to address the, the PCBs. Um, 
But if it, if it doesn't pass, then it, it's really, it's back to square one for a council and a board to figure out what uh, the town would want to do with JFK going forward. Do you have another, I'll call you back up because I haven't closed the public hearing, Tim, so. Go ahead, Tom. Through you, um, on busing too, on the issue of busing, that wasn't answered. I know that's not our purview. It's been a while since I've been on Board of Ed, but I, but I do remember the Board of Ed sets the amount of seats that they take in, and we get paid, uh, much like CREC schools do, to take in X amount of students from around the area. I just want that to be said, though, that's not because we have open seats that we just start filling filling it up. and and. Yeah, that's why I want to clarify that. And I don't know if there's any administrators out there that could could actually uh, speak to how we go about uh, choosing the amount of uh, people we accept into our system. That it's a set it's a set amount of people that's set from the board of ed or from administration. Just to, I would imagine it would be based on empty seats, but it still has to be uh, right. So yeah, so I, and I just. I wish I could answer that, okay. but I can't. It should be answered. Donna? Actually, um, Jack had the question on the crack school, why it was so much cheaper. It's so much cheaper because it only holds 650 to 700 students, and the JFK will hold 1,200 students. So there's, you couldn't fit those kids in that. So if you do a little bit of a I guess an estimate as to what a high, um, middle school would cost that would hold those students. You're going to be around 105 to 110, and if they're at 95, that's your economy of scale to go into renovate to know. All right. Before I close the public hearing, one last opportunity. Anyone else? Go ahead, Tim. Come on up. I only answered part of my question. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just trying to clear. I'm looking. I, I understand that we'd have to go to referendum, but what would be the percentage that we'd have to pay? And I think that's the the difference there. I know we're responsible for it. If it's uh, maintenance and things like that, we'd be responsible for. Um, I think most of it, if if they consider it maintenance. But what if, if we were to get reimbursed from the state? I assume that would be different than the 70 or 71 percent that we're getting. Drastically. Now reduce from the 70 percent because at least how it's been explained to us the state of connecticut believes in renovate as new mm -hmm. because you've got buildings that you just can't push to the side and and leave vacant so they want municipalities to reuse the building stocks that they have so they they really put a focus on renovate as new enfield high school classic example um, and they did a great job with the building. Mm -hmm. um, so the 70% reimbursement, what we've been told, because we got our paperwork in by the end of June and filed, that that is our reimbursement rate for this project is 70%. The legislature will reset percentages um, in the upcoming fiscal years for, for projects, but because we put the, it's, it's based on when you file with the state, not when you get a, an approved project. So we're locked in at 70% because that's our current uh, reimbursement rate. Um, to do <clears throat> non-renovate as new projects, I believe it goes, and Chris, you can nod if this is right or, or wrong, but it, it really goes to the specific item that you may be renovating. So the state could put out a reimbursement rate for um, auditorium, well, not or but say like an cool. HVAC okay. system. And they may say, we'll reimburse you X percent if that's just that project. But it never, ever gets up to that 70% level. And it's a, it's a much lower percentage if there's any percentage that they would offer. Okay, and just a, a correction, a question was raised, I can't remember who brought it up here, about the, um, the heating system and the air conditioning system at Enfield High School. It is now currently working. We went to a meeting, Don and I were at a meeting just a, two weeks ago. Everything's clear on that. So just to you know, there was a problem with it, balancing out 
one of the, the I guess, the growing pains of opening up a, a new school. But it's all working 100% uh, right now. Okay. All right. Thank you, thank Tim. You. Anyone else before I close the public hearing? <clears throat> all right. Very good. Thank you very much. I'll close the public hearing. And at this time, I would ask everyone in the audience to please stand uh, for a prayer, which I get to lead today. <laughs> I didn't know it, but um, I actually found one that I think is very appropriate, and I'm going to, um, in, in keeping in mind um, the hurricane that we had in Houston and uh, the pending hurricanes that are, are coming towards the East Coast, um, you know, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Florida, and who knows, a week from now, it could be up in our neck of the woods. Um, I found this, and it's a reflection of the heart, and um, it states, it takes a small army of men and women to make sure that a city, and in this case, was the size of Houston, but I can say in a town the size of Enfield, to run smoothly. Take time out to thank God for those who work in the public service sector. And with that, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And may we have roll call, please. Just a quick question. Will Councillor Davis will well, roll start with her? No, it was a mistake. Yeah, so we didn't update the agenda, so... You could, who's, who's next after Davis? And I did mine last month. And you month. did, oh, and, and, and Ed did it last month, so. Whoever's after uh, me. So, well, Councillor Falk is out, so it will be you. So it's me. Yeah. So we All can right. start with me. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Copeland. And I'm here. Yes. Deputy Mayor Lee. Councillor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Suzak. Here. Councillor Arnone. Here. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Falk. There's eight members present who are absent. Okay. Um, next would be the fire evacuation announcement. Just want to remind everyone in the audience that in the event that the fire alarm sounds here at Town Hall that we all must evacuate the building. Closest exit would be to the rear of Council Chambers and out to the front of Town Hall. If you choose to take the side door, which is to your right and our left, we then ask that you take the back set of stairs to the back parking lot of Town Hall. Uh, minutes of the proceed, oh, and in the event that an AED is needed, there is one located in the lobby on this floor. Uh, minutes of the preceding meetings, we have three. First is a special meeting August 7th, 2017. So moved. By Councilor Arnone, seconded by Councilor Sakala. Discussion on the minutes. Sensing none, show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimous. Regular meeting August 7th, 2017. So by Councillor Denny. Second. Seconded by Councillor Arnone. Discussion? Show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimous as well. And special meeting August 17th, 2017. So moved. By Councilor Arnone, seconded by Councilor Sakala. Discussion? Show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Okay, next item on our agenda is our special guest section. And at this time, I'd like to call forward uh, State Representatives Carol Hall Greg Stokes and uh, the family of William Edgar. If you could all please come forward. And council should probably stand. stand. Yep. Yeah.
All right. Okay, <laughs> the oldest is getting this, okay. So we have a state citation for your father. I will read it to you um, and on behalf of the entire General Assembly. The State of Connecticut General Assembly, in memoriam, it will be hereby known that the Connecticut extends its sincere condolences and expressions of sympathy to the family and friends of Lieutenant William Red. J. Edgar who, Jr., Jr., excuse me, Enfield Police Department retired on the passing of Lieutenant William Red J. Ed, Edgar. Red passed leaves a huge void in the community. He is so dear, he so dearly loved, first as an Enfield patrolman and then as a lieutenant in the Enfield Police Department. He worked tirelessly to keep this town safe and as a town councilman from 1995 to 1999, and then again from 2001 to 2017, he gave selfless to better the lives of all Enfield residents. A World War II veteran, Red was devoted to his family, his community, his state, and his country. He will be missed by all who knew him, and this citation was introduced by Senator uh, John A. Kissel of the 7th District, Representative Carol Hall of the 59th, Greg Stokes of the 58th, given this, this is dated the 27th day of July, 2017. Master M. Looney, Pro Tem, Speaker of the House, Joseph Arsimowitz, and Secretary of State, Denise Merrill. So you truly have our deepest sympathies and we, we all loved Red and we all, we were gonna, he's gonna be a huge loss to this town, so. I just want to say, uh, first of all, our condolences. The moment I heard about it, I think I was on vacation. We were at the Cape, I think, and we heard about this and and uh, contacted George right away. And um, just just real quick here, um, there's uh, Red Egger was some. One thing about him I admired, but also frustrated me, was I love to debate him. Um, I actually think him and I like picking on each other. The only problem was he was so well prepared. And, uh, and, but what I loved about him most of all was the fact that when you debated with him and uh, when we had our times, uh, when everything was over with, the next meeting you'd walk in, if you had a sick grandchild that he heard about, he'd ask about them, how they're doing. I call the old Tip O'Neill thing uh, where uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill would argue and fight and for their battles what they believed in. And at the end of the day, they sit down and have a beer when it was all over with, because uh, it's, it's too, too important not to make sure you don't give up friendships and respect for one another. And so Red set a good tone in this community for that kind of leadership, and he will be missed. So I want to thank you all for sharing him with us on the council, but also with the community of Enfield here. Thank you. So. I'm going to add a quick note. Um, Red and I served a long time together on the town council, as, as you all know. And uh, we had, like, like Greg had said, many debates. But I have to say, near the end, him and I were having a lot of very personal phone calls back and forth to each other. Um, we discussed issues, and he was willing to listen to both sides of the aisle. And I think that said a lot about him. Um, and I think he always had the best interest of the town first and foremost, and that is truly undeniable. So I learned to um, respect Red over the years. Um, my husband had the great fortune of working under him for many years, as you know, and also has a great respect for him. So he truly is, is, is gonna be missed and he's, a huge hole on the council. I don't know how it'll ever be filled, honestly. There's nobody that can fill his shoes, so. Um, does any of the family want to say something um, at all? Are you, George? I, I, speaking for all of us, I, I guess I just want to thank all the council, previous councils, the police, uh, the public, uh, the outpouring of sympathy um, made a difficult time easier. So thank you all, and thanks for coming out tonight, and thank you both. Yeah. You're welcome.
Come. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah. There's a ton of them. They get elected. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll say goodbye. Yeah. We're good? All right. Um, our next on our agenda under special guests, uh, we have a presentation from the Enfield Together Coalition. I know there's a number of representatives, so all come forward, please. Oh, Jean's going to stay in the audience. What's that? So what do I turn back? Can you pull your computer closer? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just introduce myself, Joan Lawson, um, Enfield Together Coalition co-chair. I co-chair with Tom Arnone. And? And I'm Annalisa Deal. I work with the Network Against Domestic Abuse, which is another youth-serving organization. But I've also partnered with the Enfield Together Coalition on the STOP Act grant. Come on. Go ahead. So you can just see who, who uh, attended our um, mid-year conference. Um, we had 10 in attendance, which was, I think, the biggest we've ever um, taken before. And it was awesome. Yep, we had representatives from a lot of different areas, too, including the town, faith, local government, the school system, other youth-serving organizations, and the community. <laughs> so uh, you see that four out of five heroin users abuse prescription medications. Um, and you can see our Dropbox, which is another plug that um, that is uh, in our police department, and you can take your unused medications 24-7. So that's a really important um, thing that our um, coalition has um, done. And uh, carfentanil is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And I don't know if you, under, if you know what it is, carfentanil, but I was um, incredibly shocked to find out um, how powerful it was that it's a powerful synthetic opioid used as a sedative for large animals such as elephants and um, that just blew me away that that is out on the in our midst as something else we need to deal with another thing we learned with the some of the new trends is that the alcohol and cigarette use is declining among the youth which is good news to hear that some of the work we've been doing is helping and lowering those rates Unfortunately, there are some rates that are increasing, like the rates of marijuana use and the rates of depression among youth. And we also learned that 
the younger youth start using substances, the more likely they are to become addicted to substances. So one of the ways that we can help our youth and help our community with preventing addiction is to push the age that they start using these things. So some of the things like moving the ages to 21 or older for marijuana, if that ever did become illegalized, or the, keeping the drinking age to 21 or older, the more we're pushing back the use of it and working with youth to convince them not to use these substances, the more we're preventing overall addiction in the community. So um, again, you, you can see the statistics after a discharge from the emergency department of an overdose that 42% did not receive any follow-up follow care, and 10% were given medication-assisted treatment, 40% received psychotherapy alone, and 7% were given medication-assisted treatment. And, you know, again, um, our coalition is working diligently to um, prevent opioid overdoses, and um, we want to see um, more that we, we can um, do in prevention. And along with that, we thought it was alarming that the kind of the gold standard or best practice is to be able to have both the medication mm -hmm. assistant treatment and psychotherapy, yet only 7% of people are getting that, which is really low. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to improve our ability to offer treatment as another way of combating this opioid crisis. Oh. And for the next slide, we have an example of a pillar structure, which is one of the things that we learned at the CAGCA conference, too, that we thought might work for our opioid task force that we have in the area now. Some of the things are things that they already work with, but there's some additional pillars that were brought up in this structure that they didn't really have before. So thinking of that overall community encompassing and all the different ways to look at the issue to think of how to create a sound structure and foundation is something they're going to bring back to the task force and see what new things they can implement with that too. Yep. So you can see um, our messaging from our teens, teens who think don't drink and again alcohol misuse costs the U.S. $224 billion per year and about $750 per person. So again just letting um, you know, prevention works. So the work we're doing in um, this community to um, really uh, help um, teens to um, not take that first drink. And 92% of alcohol consumed are by 12 to 14 years old, and it's binge drinking. And uh, you want to talk about Europe? I know you. And so when talking with teens and alcohol, one of the things that comes up is a lot of times people say that Europe has a lower drinking age and they're doing fine. Maybe we would reduce some of these problems if we just let kids start drinking earlier when they're at home and they're safe or whatever different people come up with to justify that. But the truth about Europe in the statistics is actually that they're not doing better off with a lower drinking age. They have the highest levels of alcohol-related deaths, of alcohol use disorders, and, al and disease from alcohol. So it might seem, when people are talking about it, how we get them used to it or in a safe environment, that's not college, but what they're actually seeing is it's causing a lot more damage if people start drinking younger in the long run. So um, the newest trends in marijuana, um, you can see a picture up there of one of our um, postcards from our toolkit, and I actually have several of the toolkit postcards that um, we um, sent out to uh, parents last year and tried to um, get the ball rolling of educating on um, marijuana. Um, and 17%, uh, uh, which is one in six people who start using marijuana before the age of 15 will become addicted, and that's startling. And also three, um, six times likely to graduate high school. And in states with legalized marijuana, 80% of profits are from 20% of users. Yeah, so it's not really as profitable as people might think that it is, too, since that's one of the reasons people give for wanting to legalize it. And just the fact that, again, 19% increased in ER visits um, credited to marijuana. So it's, it's really a, a problem. Um, and, um, yeah. 
And they think that, and some of the problem that people don't consider with marijuana is they think that in like older days that people used it and it wasn't a problem, but they're not considering that it's made differently these days. So they were saying in Colorado, they saw that the smokable marijuana had 42% THC in it. And it's that increase of the other chemicals that's actually making it more dangerous, making it more addictive and making it more problemsome. And while people think that are a lot of people, I think are looking to Colorado as an example now because of their legalizing it. And one of the things they talked about was that half of all event planners surveyed reported Denver is an unfavorable location. So it's something that's having a negative effect on the community as a whole and people's desirability for being there. Uh, we, we also learned something about marijuana policy that we think is important going forward in when ideas come about legalizing it. Some seats have not been able to control necessarily the fact of it becoming legalized and that question will maybe come up in Connecticut. But one thing that we can do if people do legalize it is there's still a lot you can do with the legislation around it which we thought was very helpful. So one of the things they've done in other areas is regulating the advertising for it. There are a lot of places have like in the one example these kind of cute names like Bud Buddy with a little cartoon yeah. character and that's very appealing for children and that sucks in that demographic. Whereas if it's supposed to be a medicine, it should be something that looks mm -hmm. like other medicines that you would buy, which they gave the example with this other one where it's kind of just a circle, you wouldn't really know it's marijuana. So trying to control how they're advertising it. Also trying to control the forms that it's Put in if it's medical. People don't have to be able to smoke it for if it's legalized. It could only be in pill form or only mm -hmm. in liquid form. And also controlling the way that it is if it's edible. You can see in one of the pictures that they've made it look exactly like gummy bears, which mm -hmm. again is really popular for kids and very childlike and appealing. Whereas if they were just a chewable tablet like you'd get for vitamins or other prescriptions, mm -hmm that's a lot less desirable to that population and caters more to looking like a medicine. So there's a lot we can do with the logos, the advertising, and the location of dispensaries. At one of the trainings I went to, they talked about in New Jersey, marijuana is legal, but you wouldn't necessarily know it because there's only like four dispensaries in the whole state. So it's something that helps control it so that if people do want to approve it for medical purposes, it's not causing addiction and drug problems either. So um, the messaging day one be there Tuesday 9-5. This is um, an initiative to again uh, promote uh, students um, staying in uh, going to school and so um, I thought that was um, I know we put messaging up in our church to encourage parents to um, s uh, spread that message. Yeah, that was one of the things they saw there and just put in place right away when we got back. Yeah. Um, so some of the takeaways are we're collaborating with the schools and um, with the faith community. Um, I'm hoping this year to um, meet with more faith leaders in our community to talk about the, the things that we are doing and how important it is um, so that they would get the layered messaging. They would hear it um, in, at home. They would hear it in school and they would hear it from the pulpit possibly. So I thought that was exciting to think about for our community. And we also want to try and better understand the needs of our community. We did one exercise where everybody at the table was given a red card, a green card, and a yellow card. And an idea would be proposed like um, some of them they did were fun ones, like Tom Brady is the greatest player of all time. And some of them were ones related to our mission, like marijuana should be legalized. And people would raise a green card if they completely agreed, a yellow card if they were questioning it, or a red one if they didn't approve of it. And it gives everybody a chance to say something. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is more shy or they think their opinion might be unfavorable, you can see it in the cards instead of just maybe a more outspoken person taking over. So we thought that was a great idea. And then the goal after that is once you hear everyone's opinion to try and make the statement something that everybody would hold up a green card for. 
So maybe people would disagree that all marijuana should be legalized, but if you put strict restrictions like medical marijuana of this kind or that it would be illegal for youth or different things, it can make the whole community agree on it. And we thought that that would be really good to hear everyone's voice, to understand not just people who share our opinion, but other people and how we can come together to protect as most of our people and get everyone on board on the mission as we can. And um, Andrea's Youth Council does the sticker shock where they go into um, liquor stores and put those um, Hey You stickers on there reminding people not to serve to minors. Yeah, so we want more youth involvement yes. like that too. Which brings us to our next one of what the Youth Council plans to do. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. They plan on having some structure changes after things that they learned from the conference. They're going to now have two youth co-chairs that'll oversee all aspects of the youth council and the adult facilitator role will now be more of coordinating the think tank approach. So that way we're getting more of the youth's ideas, more things that they think will work and kind of encouraging them to step forward and reach out to their peers in the way that they think is the best. And they're also going to start the STAT short-term action teams where they're going to put on programs like um, Coffee with a Cop. That's something we heard worked in another town where people would have all the parents could come in and have coffee and talk to the cops and answer them, um, ask them any questions they had. And it kind of builds up that community bonding between the law enforcement and people and also gives parents information they need. We wanted to work on having prevention bulletin boards at the high school, a rock campaign with prevention messages, and establishing an Instagram account. So it's taking kind of things that are popular or trendy with youth mm -hmm. and using them as ways to engage with our message. Needless to say, we always come back with lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the next steps, the youth sticker shop shock um, with the pharmacies. So again, like with the alcohol, that the uh, youth would go into the pharmacies and um, put stickers on um, their, the medications and um, again, uh, warn people about the dangers and taking those medications to the box. Um, We're also working on our digital marketing to try and come up with a consistent message around the substances that we're working with. We've been doing a lot recently with the marijuana campaign that'll hopefully be rolling out soon and finding messages that are, impo are positive and encouraging for the community, but also give them the information that they need. So the coffee and conversation, really just um, meeting with um, residents in our community and having a cup of coffee. Um, and just getting to know some of the uh, needs that they're concerned about. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to do um, that with um, over coffee and conversation. And then with the Stop Act grant partnership we have now, it's working with the high school and college on programs that educate them about alcohol and how it creates an increased risk of violence or sexual assault. We have some classes scheduled with as Nuntuck for that, and we've been doing tabling with them, and we have a lot of plans going forward. The same with the high school and the youth groups. We're coming up with a good presentation that we think will be really effective in talking to them more about it. And going to the CADCA conference, I was able to get a lot of ideas that have worked on other colleges that we can use with as Nuntuck or different interactive activities to do with the youth in these programs. And I'm just going to drop down to the faith-led community forum. Again, just getting, um, having an opportunity where all those in the faith community could come together. I could give them information about um, the, the um, areas we are working on and just help them to be educated and to be able to pass that on to their congregations because um, that is a really important area I don't think we've um, really hit on yet. And so I'm hoping to... Um, do a forum with the faith community. We wanted to see more about what we could do with policy change at a town level, what types of things our town's doing well, maybe looking to things other towns are doing as role models and taking ideas of different things that we can put into place with that. We also thought of the idea of some places mentioned having incentives to attend educational forums, mm -hmm. like one school, if the parents came, they would get a free parking pass for their student at high school. 
we thought that with so much to do, sometimes it can be easy mm -hmm. to overlook things like this, but we want to really get our message across. So maybe that little incentive would help. We've also been doing the hidden in plain sight, which mm -hmm. is like a mock bedroom to, that parents can walk through interactively and see how teens might be hiding things that relate to substances, how they can spot them out. And that starts a good conversation too with them, I think a lot of times being surprised at some of the things they never would have known. We've even had um, people that would probably be more educated like that, like police officers go through and say, oh, I didn't even know that that was something that they were doing. So it's really eye-opening for people to see all these different ways and what they should be on the lookout for. And through that program, we also have some things like the simulation goggles that simulate the experience of being intoxicated through alcohol or marijuana. So the kids have a lot of fun doing that, but it also teaches them a lot of what that experience is like, how much it really interferes with their coordination and learning. And the Hidden in Plain Sight was featured at the um, July for the July celebration. So some of you might have gone through that tent. It was pretty eye-opening. Oh, thank you for hearing about our trip. We had an amazing time. We learned so much and got so many additional resources and were able to connect with people all around the world. I yeah. remember you were talking to some people from pretty far away. Yeah, so Puerto it, Rico, yes. Yes, yes. in Puerto Rico, yeah. Hawaii, Alaska, all different mm -hmm. people. So it was really great to hear what other people are doing. But also, I think, to hear how well we're doing here in Connecticut. I think we're mm -hmm. pretty much at Cutting the forefront edge. of a lot of it. <laughs> So hopefully and, we can see that way. And I just want to say I personally feel privileged to be able to and honored to be able to go and represent Enfield um, from the faith community. It's a real honor. Um, one last thing I do, I will bring these up and you can take them and pass them out. Uh, North Central Opioid, Opioid Addiction Task Force is having um, um, a speaker on September 26th and this is helping traumatized children learn and succeed and it's really for um, these children who have seen too much so um, the speaker will be Ed Edward G. Jacobs and um, would really encourage you if you can come and hear that presentation that's on September 26th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. here in Enfield at the council chambers right here so I'll pass these out and do you have any questions that you want to ask us? Any questions or comments from the council, Tom? This is always, thank you. Um, being a co-chair is really, <laughs> you are the chair. You do all the work. Annalisa, great work with the colleges too. We really appreciate that. And from the conference, I say one thing from the conference, the, the keynote speaker that was the director of the uh, DEA, uh, Chuck Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. And he said a number that it literally took me days to really sink in, 66,000 deaths from opioid, opioid um, overdoses in the country last year, 66,000. And you know, it just didn't settle in. You had to hear it several times to actually say that number. That, that's a combined uh, population of Enfield, East Windsor, and Summers in one year. And that's, that's just how he framed the crisis that we're in today and how they, they're starting, and, and Google it if you get a chance, uh, the DEA's 360 program that they're starting to work with mental health and hospitals to try to get help for the uh, people that overdose so they're not just com constantly being rerun back into the system, which is really happening right now. So, so thank you for allowing me to open my eyes, too, with these conferences because they're really uh, um, thought-provoking. Thank you. All right. Ed? Yeah, thank you very much. You guys do a wonderful job. And, uh, keep up the good work. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Mike? Hi, guys. Just curious. You mentioned, uh, so the the medical marijuana. So curious if other, so I don't know if it was kind of with Colorado being an example. You know, it's interesting, the, the those ER visits, I'm sure, are out or costing more than the revenue they're getting from, mm -hmm. from the tax yeah. revenue, I'm sure. So, le so learning or using the opi opioid situation as an example where again originally most doctors again are well-meaning mm -hmm. individuals they want to help their patients so they're prescribing you know mm -hmm. painkillers again not necessarily you didn't see the advertising at that point but then of course it exploded right mm -hmm. so the well the well-meaning started right. that problem so how do you prevent that and I'm not saying I'm against medical marijuana 
But how do you prevent the same thing where, again, someone comes in who's the doctor wants to help that person, so they're subscribing the medical marijuana within five years. Uh, maybe it's not as potent as drug as, you know, heroin, you know, but to your point in Colorado, they're finding those strains now are so synthetic. Who knows what's happening? Who knows what's in the chemicals in those? Mm -hmm. So does that, as, uh, I mean, was that kind of discussed as, you know, I mean, if that's the route many states, maybe even Connecticut goes, it's, it's not as simple as, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to, the doctors are going to be the ones we're going to mm -hmm. trust. I'm not mm -hmm. saying you can't trust the doctor, but you get my point, right? Well, we do have some things to, to go along with that in Connecticut. Like they have the prescription drug monitoring program, so they keep track of sometimes people will go to several different doctors to right. get those prescriptions. So they originally might not have noticed that because one doctor is only prescribing so much. So I think through the prescription monitoring is going to help a little bit and also educating those people. But for some of the things like the medical marijuana too, I think being able to take it slower, like with states like Colorado already legalizing mm -hmm. it, we could watch how that unfolds, get more research from mm -hmm. it instead of just jumping in to quickly be the next person to do it. Right. So I think that that would be helpful too to actually, like one of the things that they talked about in the session I went to with marijuana is it's getting passed legally, but we don't have any of the stuff we have with prescriptions where it says what dosages are right. safe, mm -hmm. if it mixes right. well with other prescriptions. So they're not taking the time to put in the research, partly be because it's illegal at a federal level, so they can't mm -hmm. do the research, but being able to take it more slowly and watch it instead of deciding we need to jump on this bandwagon, I think would be really helpful. Okay. And okay. right now we only have medical marijuana. We don't have recreational right. in Connecticut. Know, so were they, I think they were going to expand into dispensaries, if I, unless I'm wrong. I know that we don't have a, but I had heard that they were looking to expand into dispensaries in the state. I could um, be wrong. Th I'm not sure, but I think that's where right. we, with policies, can say, okay. We, lo we love to be involved right. in policies. Yeah, that, right. This, yeah, I, I agree with and you I think guys. that's the, the um, good thing we learned. There are things we can do um, my, with yeah, the policy. Another my, policy. My recommendation is just yeah. hopefully folks yeah. don't say because we're getting tax revenue, that's right. the reason why we mm -hmm. do it. Right, yeah. Because the cost eventually will yeah, far gonna, exceed exa the tax exactly. revenue. Exactly. Yeah, one of the other things they talked just going with the marijuana uh, medically, they said with the dispensaries too, that you can control through policy what type of doctors they are. So making sure it's something like, like Hartford Medical Group or like mm -hmm. whatever professional doctor instead of just some technical PhD off the street. They said a lot of people mm -hmm. get away with claiming that they're doctors of it when they're not what we would actually like consider a primary care doctor. Just curious, I'm sorry, just curious on the Europe, the Europe, uh, you know, statistic. Like, for example, Iceland, you know, you hear that Iceland is one of the, I think, the highest, one of the highest alcoholic, you know, uh, is it, not to be, to make it simple, is it simple as boredom? And some of these where, you know, again, if, you know, how do you, how do you get the kids out of the, you know, out of their cellars and doing those stuff? Because if you think of Iceland, it's dark most of the year, you know, you can't leave the island, so folks are drinking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just from the pure, you know, I don't know if that was, but I think that's part of it. I mean, I know I'm a little oversimplifying it, but. Depression. Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's yeah. actually one of the things we're looking at a little bit with our Stop Act grant is not only talking about not using alcohol, but talking yeah. about some of the reasons why. Like, one of the ways we start the presentation is asking why they think teens drink, and people will say a whole range of things like stress or right. boredom. So part of the presentation is teaching them different mm -hmm. ways to handle those. Like we did a table at As Nuntuck that I split up into three topics where one was um, how alcohol is not a good way to manage stress or anger. And so we handed out stress balls, journals, uh, mandala coloring pages, different things they could use to relax instead. And um, then like some people will use alcohol for an icebreaker. So we had a bunch of little icebreaker questions that mm -hmm. people came over and really liked from simple things like how are you to saying something like, oh, I like this song, do you like it? Just trying to get people to mm -hmm. rethink the reasons they use it and healthier alternatives. They said at the conference, especially with young children, if you work with the elementary schools, it's not necessarily teaching them not to use drugs, although that's important, but also building up resiliency skills. So 
that they don't the need to turn to that as a resource. Yep. So I think good and I think is. showing what it, an actual drink looks like, the amount, I know that was something that was very interesting. Uh, you know, I think you I think you said you showed the first, and I, I, my last comment or question is when you were showing the the, the presentee or you know the the perfect attendance in your first slide when I first yeah, slide. Yeah. Now there is a great policy rewarding staff and kids who yep. show up. Yeah. Because showing up is ninety percent of the battle. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further comments from the council? Can I leave these? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can just cut the start. You can start right there. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody want to look at the packet of the postcards? I can leave these. Yep. Welcome awesome. Thank you very much. You Appreciate you coming in. Yes. And next up, we have Paul Russell, IT Support Services. And these all go together. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm here to kind of just give a update and uh, of statuses where, where the IT department is and just kind of kick off our 2017-18 year. Uh, the IT department is responsible for providing support not only to all the municipal departments but also the public schools and we also support uh, for the fire, fire departments in town as well. Um, we provide some technology consulting for North Central Health District as, and, uh, and, lo and they look to us for setting up some of the technology standards that, uh, that they're using. Uh, recently, some of our uh, biggest accomplishments have been we've replaced the school's administration uh, computers and put them on a three-year lease so now all of the technologies that we provide for the town teachers and uh, school administrative staff are on uh, three-year leases so now the oldest equipment that will be cycling through our organization will be three years old which is a major benefit not only in keeping up to date with technologies but also it provides the technology that's at a better of uh, a newer level and there's less uh, breakdowns and, and issues with the equipment that we're finding out with some of the older equipment that we're supporting. But it's great that now we're on a, on a rotating three-year uh, uh, three lease for all the, our major areas of support. We've implemented a new software uh, package for our service desk and for tracking issues that are coming in and assigning them to the proper technician or the proper resource much quicker. We're getting a better turnaround time. We've already seen improvements for our uh, response rates going to 68% uh, first call resolutions. So we're getting some real good benefits from that, along with adding an additional position to our service desk, our uh, administrative assistant has been helping out tremendously on those first calls so we we've, we've been seeing a, a great success in that um, we've completed a phone vendor uh, conversion with our uh, our our internal phone system we had the unify company that provided the the maintenance and support on that system and they were forcing us to do an upgrade which was going to be rather expensive we found a third party vendor that is going to allow us to maintain our current system and provide us much better services and local services so we started that con uh, that contract back in Jul uh, july and so far so good we've had three uh, immediate responses that they've helped us with and far superior than our original vendor support so we're we have uh, great expectations for that. We've completed a MUNIS, a full MUNIS, our financial payroll uh, core systems upgrade that affects both town and schools uh, to the latest version. Again, being, being a hosted solution, it makes it a lot easier for us to do that. This last version upgrade that we had to do would have required us for uh, to replace several servers on site. And since it's part of our hosted solutions, uh, we got the benefits of the server and hardware upgrades as part of our contracted services. Uh, two, two of our employees uh, successfully completed uh, the Black Belt Six Sigma certification process, uh, Bob Murray and Cindy Anderson. 
that provides resources that we have to take a look at our our services and provide uh, a better, more uh, uh, efficient solutions as as far as how we're rolling out. Uh, it was it's already been noticed in our desktop and uh, laptop deployment services, reducing the number of days. Uh, which were five in rolling out devices down to under three hours. And by going through the process and evaluating some of the key areas that uh, improvements could be made in, we were able to provide these services much faster. Uh, what we're hoping to accomplish and our plans are for the, for the upcoming year is we're going to be providing a greater level of access with our Wi-Fi with enhanced security where uh, people who will be visiting all of our buildings will have the opportunity to register for the Wi-Fi and gain better access on the internet. Our plan is for rolling that out uh, by the end of this calendar year, so by January. Um, residents as well as visitors to any one of our buildings will have the opportunity to register and get a higher level of internet access, or they can still come on as a, as a, as a guest with just limited access. But, uh, as part of our security initiatives that we're rolling out town-wide, uh, it's very important to know who's on your uh, system and what they're doing. Uh, and if they choose not to be identified, um, you, you segment them off of your network. And um, our network infrastructure allows for that. Uh, we're doing a website redesign that we're looking to rebrand and roll out for January 2018. We have a subcommittee in place establishing some governance rules and regulations that we're going to take into uh, building the new site so that it's more dynamic, it changes uh, readily, and everything has the same look and feel. You, you return back to pages, you don't get just left off on areas in which we, where we see uh, problems currently with our current website solution. Um, we'll be in the process of doing our refresh technologies for the municipal. So desktops and laptops um, for municipal and uh, public safety will be replaced in April, and then the teachers will be, uh, their devices will be up for renewal in June. So we have a couple more uh, large rollouts, about an additional, tw it'll be about 1,200 devices that we'll be replacing from April through June of uh, 2018. We continue our process of migrating our local servers to hosted and the Microsoft Cloud. So again, taking away the, the need and, uh, to upgrade our hardware, we're moving those to cloud-based services where it's also in a better, more secure environment. And it also provides us the ability to uh, easily uh, transition from one server to another. So virtually eliminating any downtime uh, due to a server malfunction we have we have it established where it's highly available, where one set of services will cut over to another server should one go down. So again, providing a higher level of security with a greater level of access is, a, is our main goals. Um, we've started a program to enhance security awareness where we're providing videos for all employees uh, to research and review and kind of just take a better understanding of what not, try not to fall for any traps or phishing attempts that are, that are currently really running rampant through government, public schools, um, and there's been a tremendous amount of recent security breaches from schools and uh, local municipalities. So we're running a series of programs and uh, education awareness campaigns throughout this year. And in working with Steve Belinda, we're going to uh, roll that into our employee orientation as well. So we look forward to greatly enhancing the security. We've, we've done a tremendous amount of work with, you know, support from the council in putting the infrastructure and securing our perimeters. Now we're working on our internal resources so that they're knowledgeable and capable of, of making better decisions on when to share information and how to share information and not put that information at risk for uh, data breaches. Um, and finally, uh, we look to complete our fiber build out to the rest of our buildings. Again, improving connectivity between buildings and reducing operational expenses from outside uh, agencies for uh, Wi-Fi and 
internet services by connecting all of our departments with a fiber, all of our buildings with fiber. We'll be able to utilize uh, two areas for internet and we'll be able to uh, better manage and better control the amount of internet resources we require because we'll have higher speeds to that internet service. So with that, I'll leave it up to some Any questions. On the rollout for the schools, now prior to this, could you give a little background to everybody on what, how computers were purchased in the school, which was a lump sum, and, and how long they had them, and who repaired them? Yeah, uh, so t traditionally we had purchased computers as money was made available, and, uh, and sometimes grants were provided, and the equipment would come in, and um, so they, they would come in brand new. Um, unfortunately, that uh, not having it as part of the operational budget, that, that com those computers became five, six, ten years old, even in some cases, where they're virtually were unusable for, uh, for the purpose that they were originally purchased with. By moving it to an operational expense, uh, we're able to distribute those costs over to the three years, and at the end of those three years, we end up paying 92% of the total value as opposed to 100% up front. So we're able to renew and refresh that technology on an operational basis. And traditionally, three to four years is really the length of time that most technologies can last, especially in an education environment. So, so this uh, originally came out of the IT uh, commission we just uh, dissolved recently. So I just wanted to give a heads up to the school and, and IT and, and council that worked together. Uh, Bill was on the committee with me to, to make these things possible. So now when a computer breaks for a teacher, they just send it out and get a replacement. They don't have to get you to have come down with a tech. It just saves the town tons of money. It, it uh, saves a lot of time, gets better technology to the teachers. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear it's it's on its way of com you know being completed yep. and um, one of those innovations in government i think uh, that, that really make a difference yep. Absolutely. thank you sure mike I'm curious do we have, do, do the employees go through an annual i don't know if training or certification where that you you kind of go over the procedures and rules to protect laptops yes those sort of things you know yep. so again to your point on phi you know that you know the folks just even though they've been here they may it's like a, just a yearly thing so they know that you know how seriously the town takes just curious if we had that yes that that is our campaign program that we're going through and a lot of it did come from when we had our budget discussions early on and you had made that recommendation we looked into it and uh, it's not only just us it's a it's pretty much a, a government-wide initiative now for the security awareness and again, I appreciate that because I think it's, you know, even if it's something you've seen every single year, it kind of sticks in your mind if you go through it. Yep. So that's great. Anyone else? Go ahead, Donna. I guess, Paul, what operating system are you on? And are you seeing any, um, as you move from one operating system to another, difficulty with your vendors keeping up with the operational systems? Some of the o older software uh, is certainly uh, our questions and concerns. Uh, right now, we have the operating systems from, uh, we have uh, Windows 7, 8.1, and 10. And now our predominant one is Windows 10. So uh, as Microsoft is pushing everybody towards Windows 10 as well, the vendors are updating. So right now, all of the primary vendors that we utilize are all uh, off uh, Windows 10 compliant. Anyone else? Very good. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Next item is public communications and petitions. If there's anyone in the audience wishing to address the council, I ask that you please raise your hand. I will call on you. You can come forward. You're first. Come on up. Um, call on you. Come forward to the front table. Please state your name and address for the record. Please keep your comments in no more than five <coughs> minutes. I do time you. If you hit the 430 mark, I will politely interrupt and ask you to wrap up. Test and we ask that you please refrain from the use of personalities. Welcome. Hi, uh, Shannon Grant, 49 Yale Drive, Enfield. I'm here looking for a couple of things. 
um, tonight to talk about Enfield Rocks. Um, late December, I uh, saw on Facebook um, on an unrelated page that somebody had posted that um, they found a rock in a brick and mortar store down in Florida. And I'm like, what is this? So I looked it up and uh, it's a joy spreading campaign. Um, simple, perfect, um, and, and so wonderful. Um, so I decided to see uh, with very little expectation uh, how it would do here in Enfield. Um, and <laughs> it's actually taken off a bit. Um, we've done a couple of meetups. It, um, a couple of you have been here, been there, participated uh, around my Facebook group. I know you are, Scott. Um, and um, I just want to talk a little bit about Enfield Rocks because it, it has really changed a lot of people's lives here in Enfield, I think. Uh, in the short term, perhaps the long term as, as we go on. Uh, it's only been six months. so. Um, but Enfield Rocks, the, the, the crux of the mission is to spread joy. And the vehicle through which we do that is, is to paint rocks and to hide them um, for others to find uh, around town in businesses if they allow us to. Uh, and I do encourage people to ask permission to do that. Um, and families are participating in this activity together um, more than uh, perhaps they have. Um, I brought a couple of rocks. This one is quite special to me. Um, this weekend, we went away like we always do um, for Labor Day weekend. And it was a rainy Sunday. It was here. It was up in New Hampshire as well, really rainy. Um, but I had an opportunity to sit down at a table. And my daughter sat down next to me. I picked up a rock. And she par started painting it. She didn't have her phone in her hand. She wasn't looking up what was on Instagram. She was sitting and painting with me. Um, these are those types of stories that I'm hearing a lot um, over the past six months, more recently because our group has grown from 15, 40, 1,000 to almost 3,100 now. Um, and we've had others in other communities uh, reach out to me and say, we want to do this too. How do I get started? And I've helped them. Um, so Enfield has this really special thing going on right now. And I just wanted to introduce you to the concept because I, I get a lot of comments from people, you know, we're, we're out walking where we weren't walking before. Um, we're exploring areas we didn't even know existed here in town. Um, we're meeting people that we never would have said hello to. And it's just, it's been a wonderful thing. Um, the group has uh, asked um, for us to perhaps find a location in town to start a rock garden. Um, and what that would be is just a designated location where people could put rocks that they want to trade or just to, to put out for others to, to look at, to, uh, to showcase. And um, we'd like to, to talk to the town council, town manager, about doing that. And a couple of ideas have been floated, uh, perhaps around the rotary walkway in, at the library, because it would encourage more walking and it would show off the rotary's good work and their playground. Um, and of course, the library. Uh, another location is the gazebo. Um, there are other locations that were suggested, but those seem to take uh, the most, uh, uh, get the most votes on the poll, so to speak. So um, I just want to encourage you to look at our Facebook group. It is called Enfield Rocks. Uh, join, join the group. Um, check out what we've been doing. It's, it's really been a really wonderful thing. And uh, it is truly spreading joy. <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who are, are just, um, it, it's, I've never seen such, such wonderful positive messages come out of a group here in town. And, and uh, I'm just really blessed to, to have been a part of that. So I guess that's it. Great. Thank you very much. Great yeah. job. Public communications. Anyone? Jack? Jack Sheridan, <clears throat> 7 Buchanan Road. Um, first, I'd like to thank the ladies of that coalition. What a great job and a great service it is to the town. Secondly, while I'm in the thanking mood, I'd like to thank all of you 
for the time and dedication that you give to the town. I know it takes a lot, and people overlook that a lot of times, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and the question I had was when we were talking about the fixing up the JFK, was you brought up boilers and the HVAC system. And I was wondering why that wasn't included in the Honeywell Energy Audit, or whatever you want to call that. Um, I would have thought that that would have been, if it's something that we need, then I would have thought that would have been a good time to include that. So that, that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Public communications? Anyone else? Thank you very much. We'll go to councillor uh, communications. Any councillor communications? Liz? Well, I have a, well, first, Shannon, um, I want to say thank you <clears throat> for starting in Phil Rocks. And, and you are right, one of the most positive messages coming through town. And to watch people post that they're just having the worst day ever. And they came across this rock that a kid painter said, and they posted and said it lightened up their day. And it's something that simple that brings joy, and it really is just spreading through the town. And then how the whole Enfield Rocks came together for the first day of orientation for all the kindergartners. So each school had 150 painted rocks for the walk, so these kids can find it and be excited about starting school. I mean, that was a great idea, and, and it brought so much joy to these four and five year olds that were already nervous about going. So thank you, and, and I love painting my rocks, and I love hiding them and putting the messages up. Um, so through uh, mayor to town manager, a question, uh, a few things came to me about the PCPs, PCBs there at JFK. So it's almost going to be a two part. Other specialists have wrote and I guess looked at the report. So resident sent me their output, saying the seventy something thousand range one, unless I re dig it back up to get it exact. Um, is very crucial and it, it's not good to have in a school. The air quality because of the age of the kids, I guess, isn't as bad. Um, but if they were two years younger, it would be. So really, what are we doing about that higher one? I don't know if it's, it's in the mortar or something. Um, I'd have to relook at it. But looking at the report, yeah, I think everybody knows. One of them, 70-something thousands to read. And, and also, what are we doing when we have pregnant staff there? Because they did say the unborn child in the stomach can absorb this, which, which is crucial. And also, the here's the other part to that, of if the referendum doesn't pass because we're doing PCB, then it has to go to another referendum. And since this is environmental, this isn't this an emergency that shouldn't have to go to a referendum? I mean, this is not healthy for our kids in the school yes, they're three years, nor the impact it's having on our staff there that's been there 10, 20, 30 years. So that was the other question brought to me. Is it in the charter that it would be an emergency and that does not go to a referendum then because it needs to be removed out of that school? And then um, to end with a positive, uh, I was at the schools today along with Ed and a few other, and every single school just had the positive, the staff, every, it was what a joy. You can just feel that like, you're just excited being at any school in town and it just you know actually that made my day just seeing so many smiling faces going around school and the staff opening the doors and the kids were excited to run in the school so and the parents yeah Jean was jumping up with her glass of wine but uh and a special <laughs> shout out <laughs> i'm just kidding that was a joke i was joking but and just uh you know a shout out to our our staff you know, at the schools that, that make it so great for our kids to be excited about going to school and to watch them all come out of school and still just have a great day. And they were just excited overall and so happy, which matter what teacher they got, they were excited. So I just wanna, you know, thank our, our staff, teachers and everybody for making it exciting for our kids to go and uh, having them love the, loving to learn. So thank you all for what you do. Thanks, Liz. Ed? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, you know, I was with Liz and uh, my grandson uh, is in a four, went into fourth grade uh, at Prudence Crandall, and I was kind of wishing that uh, I could sit down with him at the uh, 
on the floor and uh, start fourth grade over again, but I guess those days are over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Years. <laughs> <laughs> Joey? Yeah. Uh, and I never got a response on it. And just for the record, it's this is Fletcher and Charnley. My radio, my uh, mic was off, so uh, I haven't heard nothing. And uh, them stop signs are really dangerous. I mean, either we need to go back to where they were, or at least put a warning sign further back because people are running them, and uh, they're not realizing. Especially when you're coming around a the corner, they sort of crop up on you. Uh, I guess that's really all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. Donna? Actually, I got through the mayor to the um, town manager. To, uh, I guess Leisure would like to know if the playscape is all set and going at Hazardville Memorial. That was our playscape of the year. <laughs> Schools opened and <laughs> everybody's there. So if you could put that on your list to get back to us as to you know, if that that's all set for the first day. And I guess there's a um, another issue that we have like throughout town and um, Bill's texted me that North Street's been talking to him about, and that's truck traffic. That the trucks really need to stop for the stop signs and they need to obey the speed limits. And I know Joey and I disagree on this, but I think you should stay on a main road when you can and stay off the smaller residential roads with your large tractor trailer trucks. And at 11 o'clock at night, please don't use your air brakes or whatever they are. Your Jake brake. Your Jake brake. Because it's 11 o'clock and everybody's sleeping in the residential zone as you go down Summers Road. So I guess those are a few issues that I'd like to see us kind of look into. And um, I guess, um, let's see if I have any. I guess I have the other questions. Should I hold questions on the par for Brian or when he does it? That will be next if you want That'll to be ask next. them. I'll, sure. I, do you want me to ask them now or wait till you do? Pray? It's your pleasure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I guess um, one of the questions I had is on the tax sale. Has conservation reviewed the list and gone, done recommendations? Okay, and we, will we receive that letter? That They usually are pretty intuitive and on the ball there, and I, I know it's always important to get something from them. Right. And later I, on, when we forget why we did something. No, and I'll, um, I'll be more than happy to comment in detail under the manager's report. Okay, great. So. And um, the solar farm, I guess I get the question is, is that an actual tax revenue to the town or is that a utility that it will be tax exempt is the question I keep getting over and over again as I walk around the streets. And I had one resident ask me if we could put, like we have cardboard recycle at the uh, transfer station outside so you don't have to weigh your cardboard and pay for that. But we also, metal is something that we make money on recycling if you could possibly put something for metal because sometimes some of us have stuff that's a little bit too big for the um the tipper barrel and we would come and you know we always hate to pay you know seven cents a pound for something that um we could put in a tipper can and the town would make money and i believe that's all i have thank you this you have to do that oh, i'm sorry <laughs> Okay, motion to spend the rules and move items A1, B1, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and L to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Motion by Councilor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Ludwig. Discussion on moving those items and miscellaneous, sensing none, show of hands. All those in favor, those opposed, unanimous. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. Anyone else? Scott Mike? Quick. Just want to remind folks the first football game of the season will be Friday night. We hope everyone will be there. And through the mayor to town manager, any thought to 
Uh, we went through the budget season of having Magic Bus be able to pick folks up who may not be able to drive to themselves to the game. That was one of the things. I'm just curious. Maybe it's too late for the first game, but maybe on the next home game. I also want to wish everyone who's playing any activity in the fall as it begins this week as school started. Wish all the teams luck and uh, hard work. And I know we might have we have possibly two teams in the high school that have a, po a real shot of winning the state title. So get out and support everybody. And um, just wish everyone a belated ha Labor Day. Everyone who works for a living, that's what makes the town great. So we thank you. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else? So I have a couple of items. First of all, um, Shannon, uh, Enfield Rocks. Um, I look at the page. I actually saw my first rock um, last week, over the weekend. I didn't take it because I, I didn't want to because I've seen the, the pictures of, of the, the kids. Um, finding them and, and posting and all that. And it is, it's, it's definitely a nice positive mes message, something different, and it does. It gets back to the basic, gets the people off of their phones, away from the television, and I, it's just thanks for bringing it to Enfield and, and spearheading the effort um, across town. Um, Jack, you had a question on the boilers. I wrote down boilers. I think you mentioned two items, but the, the reason why they were not in the performance, uh, energy performance contract referendum is at the point in time, and I believe this is correct, at the point in time where we had to make the decision and come up with the dollar amount, the Board of Education was still having the debate over Fermi uh, JFK. And so actually both buildings were removed um, because nothing was finalized at that point in time. Um, and then the thought process was what, uh, whatever building was going to be selected, s those types of repairs um, would be done within uh, a referendum to bring the building up to code. So that's from recollection. Um, and then I've got uh, one more, uh, another thanks that um, people asked me to pass on, and that's to the the police department and to DEEP, uh, thanking for their efforts at the Scanic River Park uh, this summer. Uh, people are actually commenting that they can return to the park and bring their family and friends there and enjoy it as it was intended to be, um, as a passive recreation area. Um, so thanks uh, to the folks that do the heavy lifting, lifting and made it possible. And then uh, got three, three items that are upcoming. Um, as we all remember, uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, um, and uh, is the, the anniversary is fast approaching and uh, the Enfield Fire District on, on Weymouth Road will be holding the annual 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony on Monday, September 11th at 6.30. Um, and again, it's at the fire station on Weymouth Road. The public is encouraged to come. Family Day on the Green is Sunday, September 17th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. right here on the town green. Uh, free for folks to come and a whole host of activities. And then on uh, Saturday, September 23rd, the 22nd annual Hall of Fame induction dinner will be held at Oak Ridge Country Club. Uh, the honorees this year are uh, Brent Ditz, Deitz, Marty Green, Karen McCartney, Jim Russell, Liz Zeroli, the 1956-57 Enfield High School basketball team, and the Kevin Barmack Memorial Soccer Tournament, which was just held this past weekend right here. Dietz? Okay. So that is Brent Dietz. So Tim Jensen sent me the information. I don't. I know Marty Green was a wrestler. I went to high school with him, or went to junior high with him. Um, but congratulations to all the honorees. If you would like to attend, the public um, is encouraged to attend. You can get information at EnfieldAthleticHOF.org. EnfieldAthleticHOF.org. And that's what I have. Anyone else? Joey. Yeah, through the mayor to the town manager. Um, I received a complaint this weekend about the lights on at Fermi. I guess it was about 10 o'clock at night, and they were still on. 
I mean, that's just really an utter waste of energy. Uh, I don't know what we can do. Uh, you know, down to point, maybe putting a sensor light or something if someone wants to play. Restrict the times it could be used, but to have lights on, especially lights like that, um, I think is a big waste of money. So I, I hope you look into it and get back to us on that. Also, <clears throat> another thing I – Bill mentioned it uh, the other day, a la other meeting, and uh, I never heard anything else about it. The street lights that we are uh, – I see fixed click. I'm seeing them. They're coming in in droves about street lights that are burned out. And – I think it's another waste of money and a waste of time to put a brand new light bulb into an old street light where if we're going to go up there to change them, even though we may have a contract with the guy to come, we should just be replacing them with the LEDs. Uh, and then whatever we have in stock, return to the wholesaler and get our money back. I mean, we're so close to replacing the whole town that I think it's crazy to be wasting money to put into the old style street lights for a month or two so they can change them so i really like to see if we can maybe start putting the leds in and uh you know even if it slows down some of the leds because we need some for stock and the other parts of town i still think it would be wise to us to return the light bulbs that we have and replace them with the leds while our people are up there and uh one last thing uh the Four Town Fair, September 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th. Hope to see everyone there as long as we don't have a hurricane. And yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a good time, and we hope to see everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joey. Anyone else? All right. Next, we have the Town Manager Report and Communications. Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Included in your packet is the uh, project and activities report, which I will be more than happy to answer any questions on. Uh, before addressing any questions or concerns that council may have uh, with regard to the material in the, the PAR uh, from the comments that were here tonight, um, Councilor Davis, regarding um, you know, regarding your comments and questions about uh, the PCBs, uh, the management plan um, on how we're supposed to address the materials that we found uh, is due in next week from uh, our uh, contractor, Fuss and O'Neill, so we'll be able to better answer your question specifically about that sample at that time uh, with regard to the health impacts for the staff, uh, in particular the pregnant staff. I'm not in a position to be able to answer that question, but I will reach out to the Director of Public Health uh, and ask her opinion on what the risk is. I can tell you that there were swipe and air samples taken in the building on uh, the 30th of August, uh, and all of those samples came back with zero exceedance in the swipe or in the, uh, the air sample. Um, let's see what else. Uh, then the issue you also had, the question you had uh, also about the emergency declaration in the charter. Uh, I'll have to confer with the town attorney, uh, but I had this similar thought when we were trying to deal with this particular issue, what would our plan be? And I believe the charter is specific to actually weather incidents. I don't believe that it's as generic um as a, a general emergency but I, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at that language again but that was a thought that we had had um, at the end of the day um, again it'll come down to um, chris and, and his staff's opinion on whether or not that could be utilized as an option to to expedite um, that issue um Councilor Bosco, just a couple of things. Um, the request and question um, about the property and the privacy issue, was that the, um, I, I want to say it was like a, a row of Rosa yeah, Sharon. They, they cut the bottom halves of the branches so they could work, and now you look right into the yard. Okay, and I thought I had a response uh, that I had sent back to you. I know that we had sent that over to engineering. Yeah, that, that's the last that response. I, okay. That's the last response I got was... Uh, that you were sending it over to engineering and I haven't heard nothing okay. since. I did get something back from engineering, which I thought I had sent to you. So my apologies, I'll make sure Thank we get you. that over to you. Uh, let's see what else. Um, let's see the stop sign reconfiguration at that intersection. That was actually um, a suggestion that we had received um, 
from an outside source. We did send that over to Sergeant uh, Meyer, our traffic uh, officer, who evaluated and did confirm uh, that new configuration. So I will also uh, send over a request to review and evaluate the size of the, the signage that is there. Yeah, maybe so we could put something further back to, to warn people because right now uh, I've, I've heard from multiple people that you know they really can't see them until they're up on top of them. Okay. I mean, so it. we will bring that to EPD's attention yeah, tomorrow at the staff meeting. Um, with regards to the field lights, uh, that is something that I have noticed and a few other folks have noticed. So that is an issue that is over at Public Works right now that B&G is reviewing as to why that configuration is what that is. So we're, we're working to get that addressed. Um, so that is not an issue that is unknown to staff. So we're, we're aware of that and we're working to fix it. Um, let's see. Um, the street light issues, I'm not aware that we are repairing lights that are out. My last conversation with Jonathan was that anything that was out was staying out until it was replaced uh, through the uh, energy performance project, but I will confer with him tomorrow to uh, make sure that that, is, uh, that that is still the case. Uh, Councilor Suzak, with request to your question on the Hazardville Memorial Playscape, my understanding is that uh, Playscape has been selected and designed, and now we're just waiting on the finance package to go out. So um, the holdup has been the administrative process and trying to implement the new uh, purchasing uh, format. So um, my understanding is the package was ready to go. There was some review and comment that came out of the town attorney's office, but I'm not uh, sure where that is at this point in time, but um, will be an issue of discussion at the staff meeting tomorrow. Uh, as will your suggestion on the metal recycling dumpster prior and prior to the entrance to the transfer station. And then did we consult with Conservation Commission on the tax sale properties? Um, kind of, sort of, yes. So it was my intent to send the entire list to the commission for review in advance of the tax sale. Unfortunately, the notice we received from the assessor on when the sale would occur um, was much shorter than we had anticipated. So what we did do was we did send the list to the chair of the commission and ask her to review that list based on um, what the commission had been looking at as priorities, some concerns um, or perspectives from the commission and recommend back to us any parcels uh, that they wanted tagged for that uh, particular sale. Uh, the chairperson did not identify um, any parcels um, through that process, but we did reach out to them to try and get input uh, prior to formalizing and finalizing that list of parcels. Uh, with respect to um, Councillor Ludwig, I'll have to ask uh, the Director of Development Services tomorrow uh, on the, the magic carpet uh, access uh, for the football games. Uh, I, I'm not familiar enough with the program and all of the, the various caveats that go with the grant funding to know whether or not uh, that's an option available to us. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for having nothing but comments during your portion of uh, Councilor Communications. <laughs> uh, that being said, I will answer uh, any questions about the PAR that may be out there. Mike? Oh, the solar farm. I'm sorry. Again, I'm not knowledgeable. Yes, there are a lot of things coming at me there. Uh, again, not knowledgeable enough on that particular subject yet, but I will have... Um, Mr. Cirillo and his staff look into that issue um, um, so we can have a, an informed response for you uh, in the near future. Sure. A suggestion, um, like for the North Street stop sign, I'm not going to, that, that, that stop sign comes up quick, no matter if you're a truck or you're a car. Any thought of putting those, uh, we have them on some stop signs around town, I what they're called, the reflector strips, mm -hmm. Th those things are fantastic. Yeah, those are full. Right. right. Are you talking approaching that intersection on Maple? Uh, the one, right? I forget the street. The no, one. It's, it's on North Street at High Meadow and South right, Meadow. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. That's the one. So that, the sign is low and you don't see it. I don't know if it'll help during the day. You're, you're in the middle of a residential street, right. so okay. a lot of it is the expectation as there's not a sign there. But those gotcha. strips are great. Okay. And, uh, you can see them at night if you ever have them around town. I don't know how much they cost, but I'm just saying if well, we have them. The, the strips, those were State of Connecticut DOT installed because oh, okay. you actually see them only on state roads. And that they implemented a new program this year where they had to illuminate um, 
stop signs so they actually raised up stop signs to a higher level they put the strips on them um, all over the place yeah they're great I mean you definitely see them yeah and Brian or through the mayor to uh, town manager economic development toolbox two two questions or suggestions as we're trying again as we've had this conversation about growing revenue we have to become more business friendly any idea or any thoughts on how we have a sort of first I'll use the word call resolution so where a business or, or a developer or someone who wants a permit, again, we're trying to solve a, you know, as best we can. So we limit the amount of time that per, that person or that business goes through the process. So sort of, again, just the idea of a first call resolution. And then secondly, as we're going through the toolbox, do we have an idea how long it takes a given business to get through the process and how much money that person has to spend? And, and so I get the idea that we get revenue from the permits and everything. But are we really hurting ourselves? We're not getting the tax dollars, which are a lot more valuable than permits. Right. So if that, just suggestions for the toolbox. If you're already doing it, then great. But kind of just you know, uh, some ideas on how maybe we can help some, you know, to grow small right. business and business in general. With respect to when you talk about when you first call. Uh, again, could, again it's, we, we actually have, we have, whether it be get them to the proper permit they have to submit, proper paperwork I keep hearing that you know we someone goes through the process they submit the paperwork and oh by the way we've got this other piece and now they're delayed right. so uh, you know again streamline maybe we could use a, a you know whatever word a, uh, a politically correct word but streamlining how's that right. um, you know and so just again how do we find ways of getting making it easier to do business for the town of Enfield as again to your conversation of how do we grow revenue Sure. Um, I can tell you that um, with respect to the, the last two items, the economic toolbox, um, one of the things that we have now is, um, if you notice in the PAR, um, we have an intern working um, in the development services um, division uh, department, and they are working on an evaluation of things like uh, what can we do to make the process faster? One of the things that um, the director and I have talked about is when was the last time we reached out to the folks that have been through the process in the last two years and said, hey, you know, you know, how do we make it better for the next guy or gal? How do we make the next time you come in here uh, for an expansion of your business, how do we make it better for you? So we're, we're trying to have the discussion on what's the best way to get that information so we can get feedback to know where are we grinding in the process and where are we, we doing well. Anyone else? Any other questions for Brian? All right, thank you, Brian. Um, next is the town attorney report communications. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in regard to the um, emergency appropriations clause in the charter, uh, there is one. I know we've done an opinion on it, and Scott maybe recalls as well. I think in 2005, we may have made an expenditure when we had the field contamination at Fermi. I think right. we, we looked at it. I think we actually appropriated money pursuant to that. So we'll look at it. Again, it's 12 years ago, so I, I don't recall specifically, but I know I've done an opinion on it in the past, and we'll look at it anew. Um, in regard to, we, we have quite a few assignments coming up for pretrials in the Superior Court on a lot of the commercial tax appeals that were filed, so I'll have a full update for you as those come up. We've had some other pretrials that I've updated you uh, via email in, in regard to some of the pending litigation we have, and there will be more uh, to report at the next meeting uh, in September as well. Questions for Chris? So, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say, I remember, I think I remember two. One, the, the soil contamination at Fermi, because it's like, I thought is we couldn't use the property at all. So what was the alternate, what was the one means? And it was an emergency um, emergency clause that allowed us to appropriate the money to do the cap. And that was, I think, tw like 12 years ago or right. so. And then I believe after the uh, October yeah. storm, Yes. And that was weather related. So the October storm when we had um, all the down trees and limbs that we had to pick up and we needed to do yeah. an emergency appropriation of funding to clean up the town. Right. I remember those two over okay. the years. And I wasn't here for that one except at public safety. I know I right. was there and I believe I 
new we periphery did do it. that we, we were did doing. We did do it, it for Fermi because yeah. remember it was like the state of Connecticut Department of Health or maybe it was deep. Right. We were under an order that was similar. With something to yes. say you, you needed to fix it. And that was um, my recollection. You didn't have time to go right. through the budget process. So we'll yep. look at that. Mike? And I'm going to start limiting your your. Uh, <laughs> the mayor to the top. It's Mike he, time. He told me I had to ask him, so I. Uh, oh. We so. were. I know he's going to ask Mr. Mayor because it had come up uh, a little earlier, and I thought um, there had been some traffic. I had received a call from an attorney that's involved, and I think some of us had read about this, and there were email traffic back and forth in regard to um, lit litigation in regard to the opioid crisis yes. um, and going after some of the pharmaceutical companies. So. Um, I had told them I thought that was something the council would be interested in. They were looking for any tool to combat that epidemic that they could find. I was correct watching the email traffic and the, ma and the mayor indicated we would be interested. So I reached out today. We will have a meeting with that firm. We'll find out um, what's going on with it and have a report or perhaps even have them come at the next council meeting uh, in September and make a report. Great. Thanks, Chris. Town attorney questions? Yes. With your microphone on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, through the mayor to town manager. Can you tell us what's going on with the, the T-Mobile? Again, uh, Mr. Mayor, I know there had been a conversation at leadership. We thought we had had it resolved pretty much, um, but they're a large corporation. They had sent it back. Uh, we agreed to what they had wanted, and, and their corporate people changed it all again. So I met with them today and representatives as well. I think it probably was fortuitous. We had some of our staff people. Actually, we brought in uh, our dispatch um, supervisor from the police department and also the, the fellow who's our town um, advisor for those individuals who actually built the tower so we wanted to look at it structurally because it's a big commitment we only have so much space there and uh, so it, we I think pretty much came to conclusion on most issues we should have a report if not uh, an actual vote for September we'll have the parties present if need be but we're really looking now at to see what is the equitable revenue that the town should receive for this because as you know um, with the explosion of cellular and internet, these companies are really bidding and competing. It's really heating up since the manager started to negotiate with them. And I just had a conversation with him um, upon his return today about it, and also the IT director. So there may be some other innovative um, avenues that may come out of this. So I'm glad that actually we took our time, and I think it probably will be more beneficial to the town in the long run. But we should have it resolved in, for the town council's consideration at the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else for Chris? Thank you, Chris. Uh, next, reports to special committees of the council. Anything Enfield High School? Do we need to keep this on the agenda as a bullet point? I don't, I don't think so. We're just closing All right. There, there, right. It's, it's going to take years, and they're closing everything out okay. until everything <laughs> through till the audit's done. But you know, for right. us, we we won't be needing to report. I don't believe. Okay. And the same with yeah. the JFK pre-referendum committee, because actually the committee's disbanded. So, Brian, if we could remove the two bullet points uh, going forward. Any other reports of special committees of the council? Then we will move to old business appointments, town council appointed items 1 through 27 all remain on the table, correct? correct. Appointments, town manager appointed, council approved. B1 through B12 remain on the table? Correct. And item C, D, E, F remain on the table, but item G, a resolution adopting the Town of Enfield sidewalk through driveway policy, is there a motion to remove that item from the table by Donna? Second. Councilor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Davis. I think I saw a hand. Um, all those in favor? Those opposed? Items been removed from the table. And let me read the resolution. Whereas a town has developed a sidewalk plan for replacement of sidewalks across driveways when required due to construction. And now therefore be it resolved that the town council, the town of Enfield adopts the town of Enfield sidewalk through driveway policy as attached. Is there so by Councilor Ludwig, seconded by Councilor Suzak. Um, Discussion. I know that there was a petition process that was added, reviewed by Public Works Subcommittee. Everything's good. Anyone comments? Joey? Yeah, the uh, subcommittee reviewed everything and 
After a nice little discussion on this thing, we came up with something that would give the residents an option to petition. So if 66% of the residents, and I'm not exactly sure, is it in the project or uh, how that's going to do, uh, but uh, if 66% of the people put a, a petition in, then it'll come back to uh, the DPW subcommittee and then they can read their piece and we could either leave the sidewalks or if it's deemed in the best interest of the town of Enfield to take them out they will be taken out but at least now you have a option to be able to appeal a decision correct so the the policy that we crafted was based on um, the traffic calming I know that's not the formal name, but there's an existing policy that involves traffic calming measures, um, and it spells out that um, I think it's 60% or 66% of the affected property owners can sign a petition and bring that forward for consideration. So what we did was we simply changed the notification process in this um, um, from our existing policy rather than right before uh, the project is set to begin, we moved the notification uh, period closer to um, at the end of the design phase uh, so that we could let folks know this is what's coming your way with respect to the street um, and if you have any questions or concerns if you want a petition um, now's the time to do so so that we could get that input in and get that before the Commission so there's no obligation by the Public Works Commission uh, to change the policy or to forward anything on to council based on what uh, what they're advised by the engineering office but it simply gives the folks an opportunity to get their concerns heard any other questions, comments? Sensing none, roll call please. Mayor Copen? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Four. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. There's eight in favor, none against, and no abstentions. That completes old business. We move to new business. First item under new business is the uh, Historic District Commission alternate position. And could we have a nomination, please? Uh, sleep Go ahead. Here. Uh, I'd like to nominate Lillian Triano. Second. Motion by Councillor Denny, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Is there a motion to close nominations by Councillor Suzak? Second. Seconded by Councillor Denny by a show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Nominations are closed. Discussion? Sensing none, roll call please. Mayor Copen? Lillian Triano? Councillor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Suzak? Lillian Triano? Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Lillian Triano? Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Lillian Triano? There's eight in favor, none against, and no abstentions. And I missed someone. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay, that completes new business. We move to items for discussion. All items have been moved to miscellaneous, so we move to miscellaneous. The first item under miscellaneous is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent okay. agenda? By Councilor Sakala, seconded by Councilor Suzak. Discussion? Show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimous. Next item, appointments, town council, appointed district two councilor. Can we have a nomination, please? Scott, on, on behalf of the council Democrats, it's my pleasure to nominate Bob Crisati at, as district two councilor. Bob's contributions to our community are numerous. As an educator for 36 years, he's made every student feel like the most important person in the room. As an athlete, a coach and instructor, Bob's contributions are legendary, helping Enfield's athletes achieve their highest goals and beyond. As a business owner, a husband, a father, and a grandfather, Bob's knowledge of Enfield's community will serve this council well. Thank you, Tom. Ed? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Can I have a motion to close nominations by Councilor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Ludwig? All those in favor of closing nominations? Those opposed? Nominations are closed. Discussion on Bob Crisati. Anyone? Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, Bob, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, have, uh, to sit down with you. 
uh, last week. Um, we have known each other for, for a number of years, and, and I, I echo um, what Tom had written in his nomination. Um, seeing you from uh, the education side, um, but also athlete, athletic, and um, I only wish that I was a good enough baseball player to have needed your skills to train me further. Um, but I look forward to working with you over the next two months, and I think you'll be a great addition to the council. Anyone else? Sensing none, can we have roll call, please? Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Bob Crisati. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Bob Crisati. Mayor eight in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Bob, if you can come on up. You, you've got, uh, if you could come on up, and um, the open chair is yours, and we'll, uh, we'll actually have a swearing-in ceremony. So if um, council could rise. Right there. And of course, I'm going to totally put you on, on the spot if you so wish, but you would have the opportunity if you'd like to uh, say anything to, uh, as you assume, the District 2 Council seat. So, Councillor. <laughs> well, uh, I would like to say thank you to everybody, and I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I cannot wait to uh, represent uh, District 2, and um, it's quite an honor for me to be sitting up here with everybody. And, um, you know, one month ago, uh, when all of this started taking place, um, it's been a, a whirlwind for myself, and uh, I'm just happy for this opportunity. I was happy to sit down with you last week and and everybody uh, we had a nice conversation and I you know I got a great support from the uh, Democratic Town Committee uh, I got a very good relationship with uh, the Republican caucus we had a nice conversation and uh, the interview was awesome and I thank everybody here for this opportunity um, and I'll put my best foot forward for the town of Enfield as a uh, you know, lifelong, pretty much a lifelong resident and uh, involved with the education and the town of Enfield and, and with athletics and, uh, and a wide variety of other activities that uh, I've been involved with in the town. And I'm just looking forward to this uh, opportunity to uh, serve the people. So thank you. Great. Thank you and welcome aboard. Thank you. All right, uh, next item on our agenda under miscellaneous is the resolution approving the transfer of funds to close the fiscal year 2017. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Chart of the following transfer referred to as Attachment A is hereby made. And certification, I hereby certify that the funds stated in Attachment A are available as of August 29, 2017. And it's signed John A. Wilcox, Director of Finance. Moved. By Second. Councilor Ludwig, seconded by Councilor Denny. Any discussion on the resolution to close out the fiscal year? And Bob, feel free, there's uh, a vote that you should limit using but use it when you feel most comfortable, and that's abstaining on, on anything that, if you don't feel 
up yeah. to par. Um, you brought them up on it. Okay. So, because if you look at your first resolution and you look at all those numbers, you're like, what? So, all right. Any any questions? Com Donna, go ahead. I guess this would be a question to, you know, John. Were there any surprises or any things that, you know, you feel that we should, you know, I mean, that's what I always do. I always like the executive summary. When I do that in my line, I say, this, this I don't like. Um, this, this year was um, was fairly typical as as in years past. Um, the uh, we did have a, a slight increase in our property insurance due to the um, the new wing and the high school coming on board. Um, the the insurance increased about thirty seven thousand dollars over what we had anticipated. Um, but that was absorbed in, in other budgetary savings, so it wasn't any additional drain on fund balance or anything. Um, <clears throat> most of the items you see in here are in the salary and uh, health insurance um, line items. Um, <clears throat> we, while we budget as best we can for those, um, we're doing it prior to the actual elections of, of health benefits. So. If somebody goes from a single to a um, family plan or something like that, um, obviously that significantly impacts a, a department. Um, the other issue, other item that we have is that uh, uh, we've got several um, several um, union contracts that have not been uh, uh, signed as of yet, have, um, and they're in process. Um, what we have done this year, and, and we actually did last year as well, was estimate the, um, make an estimate for an amount of, of an, what salary increases um, would impact last year's expense. Because um, typically when they're signed, they would go back to, uh, the, you know, you'd get a retroactive payment. Um, well, that would increase the actual expense and an amount over budget. Um, the it won't impact the, the the budget was was really more of a transfer from the collective bargaining line item and that we uh, that we set aside every year for those types of events um, so m you'll see a large number um, coming out of the uh, transfer from collective bargaining line item and that's mainly for that that stuff all set good any other questions for John on this? Thank you, John. Sensing no other questions, we'll go to roll call, please. Mayor Copen? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakawa? Four. Councillor Crisati? Four. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution, request for transfer <laughs> funds for community development, $33,000. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made to community development general fund overtime, 30655 Social Security FICA, 1900 Medicare, 445 from community development general fund purchase professional and technical $33,000 certified the funds are available John Wilcox director of finance so moved by Councillor Arnone seconded by Councillor Suzak discussion Gina so it seems to me this is sort of what we're going to be doing temporarily, but do we have a long-term plan on how we're going to deal with the fact that we are not going to be working with the town of Windsor anymore on this? So one of the things that the director has been tasked to do is to review and evaluate where his department resources should be allocated, especially in light of what's going on now with 
um, Mr. Hallisey no longer um, being employed through our joint contract with Windsor. So it's one of those things where they're beginning to take a look at, um, you know, what is the best way to respond to this particular. So, um, you know, do we find a way to take the two part-time code enforcement officers and use uh, this money to augment them and make them full-time uh, to, you know, to, to effectively get those hours back? Do we reapportion the work that Jim was doing in a variety of ways to, to different personnel in the department? So the short version is we don't have an answer for you specifically as to what we intend to do with the space, but we recognize that it's an opportunity to try and find some uh, efficiency based on the staff that we have um, and the dollars that are available now as a result of the vacancy. Tom? So how closely does the enforcement officers work with this kind of, I mean, is it that close of a, of a, a, a it seems like it's in two different fields. So that's something that um, the director and I are, are trying to better understand. So we seem to have building enforcement and we seem to have housing enforcement and we have code enforcement and we have blight enforcement so we've got a lot of different titles but they all end in the word enforcement so to me it seems that there has to be some kind of economy of scale here if we take enough time to sit down and look at that so you know what does that mean as far as you know some of Jim's work was uh, was bidding um, these clean and lean projects if you will so you know in previous lives this was work that we would bid out in advance of the actual year so that work was done in the low cycle and then we had contractors on call so you would just send them the list because they had already bid per man hour so the amount of time that jim put into having to do these little mini projects these little five six you know property bid packages at a time well, if we take a step back and maybe we do some planning, is that something that he needs to do, that we need a body back to do? Um, you know, the code enforcement staff, you know, they handled a lot of this and then it got handed over to Jim to work on. So they were already touching the process in some way, shape or form. So, um, but Mike and I are, you know, still by all means relatively new. So I'm sure that what he and I perceive, perceive in our mind to be, I won't call it a simple fix, but some procedural changes to address these issues. I'm sure that once we sit down with staff and we have some additional conversations with the town attorney's office, I mean, a lot of this is statutory. So how much of it can we combine? How much of it can we bring together? So, you know, in a perfect world, is there efficiency of scale in there? Is there a, a process change that can make this more effective? Yes. but you know, the, applying the theoretical to the practical or to, you know, separate different tasks. So we need to, to work our way through that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Stay, around. Stay on it. Yep. Anyone else? <coughs> Sensing none, roll call, please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution setting a public hearing to amend Chapter 58, Article 3, Section 58-61. That's what, et sequitur? Is that right? Of the Code of Enfield, Connecticut. Whereas on October 5th, 2015, the Town Council adopted Chapter 58, Article 3, Section 58-61, an ordinance prohibiting aggressive and unsafe panhandling or solicitation. And whereas Reed versus Town of Gilbert, 576 U.S. 135, I don't know, the SCT 2218192LED 2D 236 2015. Wow. This is legalese. Yes, it sure is. So hopefully I got it all right. And its progeny have had significant impact on the enforceability of the town's panhandling ordinance. Now, therefore, be it resolved, Chris, did you write this resolution? 
The Enfield Town Council <laughs> will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, September 18th, 2017, at 6.50 p.m. to allow interested residents an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the amendment of Chapter 58, Article 3, Section 58-61, et, et sec, of the Enfield Town Code. By council, <laughs> by Councillor Sakala and seconded by Councillor Arnone. Discussion. Roll call, please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution to appropriate $95 million for the expansion and renovation of the John F. Kennedy Middle School and to authorize the issuance of bonds, notes, or temporary notes in an amount not to exceed $35,500,000 with the balance funded by grants and other available funds. There is a very long resolution. Can I? Yeah. So is there a motion to waive the reading by Councillor Sakala, seconded Second. by Councillor Arnone? <laughs> Joey, if you want me to read it, everyone's going to take a paragraph. There you go. <laughs> um, discussion on uh, discussion or waiving the reading. All those in favor of waiving the reading? Those opposed? So it's unanimous. Um, then I need a motion to approve the item by Councillor Suzak, seconded by Councillor Sakala. Then we go to discussion on uh, the resolution. Councillor Denny. I think you just let the public know that <clears throat> um, no matter what happens, that we're only on the hook for the 35500 and not the total amount. Uh, if the state reneges on the money, then we're not going forward with that that's all thank you thanks ed joey uh, i've been i've been this has been terrible uh this is probably one of the tougher decisions that i've had to do as i was on the council i know the building committee did a great job they brought us what we needed uh, i will support this to go to referendum because that's where i feel that the public should be the one to uh, choose this even if it goes against some of the things I feel, I, I just feel it's a little bit too rich for our blood. And I just, in a perfect world, it's a no-brainer. I just don't trust the second hand of the state taking it from somewhere else. But realistically, if this does get done, it, it is a no-brainer because we'd be paying at $35 million either way. It just, to me, I just think it's too expensive a project. And, um, but I will support it going out the referendum because I feel that taxpayers know the best. And I wish we could do that with our budget. So I will be supporting it tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. Comments, questions? Mike? Again, this is a tough one for me too because I support JFK as the middle school. It is a great middle school. The staff does a fantastic job. And again, for me, that's what education is about. It's about good teachers, curriculum that challenges the kids and good parents so i agree with councilman bosco that this this just um for me it's just it's what what i feel like we can afford and what i can afford as a taxpayer i don't think we can afford 95 million dollars and i was just want to read a little bit for folks just to understand some of the some real numbers for the state of connecticut because again we all pay state taxes too just to be clear here so from a reuters article back in august of uh, august 23rd Again, there's a number of things commented, but I'll read. By many measures, Connecticut debt level are the worst of the 50 U.S. states. It is the most net tax-supported state debt per capita nation at over $6,000 versus the median of 1,000, and that's according to Moody's. We, ha it is, we have the highest debt service as a, as a portion of state revenue. That is what my issue is. The school is a great school. We need to fix it. But the fact that we are already way out of control in debt just doesn't allow me to support this. Donna. 
I just have to put a little bit of balance. The state of Connecticut puts that pot of money together and it's going to spend it on schools. It's going to spend it on schools in Enfield or it's going to spend it on schools in other communities. We've done our due diligence to get in at our 70% reimbursement. Town of Enfield does a lot for the state. Yes, the state needs to fix itself, but I will not have the state fix itself on the back of Enfield. I will support this because I see more things. If they're not done right and they're done with a Band-Aid, I'm doing them over and over and over again. We've gotten 50 years of serviceability out of this building. We've maintained it. We've done the best that we can. We have reached a point where it needs to be renovated to new. You're going to get a new building because they're going to bring it down to the core and, and shell, and they're going to put everything new. Our students need to be prepared for the future. So for me, I've, I've attended all the meetings. I've listened to everything. I will be supporting this. Tom? I agree, Donna. Um, one step further, we can't kick the can down the road any further. I'm not going to kick it to the next council, and, and something has to be done with this building, and I think this is the most sound uh, way of doing it. It's going to cost us $35 million, no matter what we do. If we've got to renovate it ourselves or we've got to take the bond money uh, to, in addition to this and, and uh, make it one great learning and education school. So I'm supporting it. Questions? Anyone? Statements? Liz? I'll be supporting this because it should go to referendum and let the voters choose if they want to back it or not. Any further comments? So I guess I'll end it um, before we go to vote. I support um, moving this question to, to referendum. Yes, it is uh, ultimately the decision of the taxpayers. Um, but in, in my lobbying mode, I also believe that the pre-referendum committee, the school system, and the town put together a really great package for JFK. We've all witnessed the great work that was done at Enfield High School um, by the, the combined teams of people led by the Enfield High School Building Committee. And, and you look at the education that Enfield Public Schools will be able to deliver in that building, it is a tremendous enhancement to the curriculum. The students are going to benefit um, for years because it is a better building that meets today's needs of education. JFK today does not, and we all know it's deficient in many areas. Um, and. Uh, we as a town and as a school system over the last 10 years have pretty systematically or methodically worked to improve the school system and we knew that steps had to be taken that that whether you agreed with it or not but we had to go from two high schools to one that we had to downsize our elementary schools to where it made sense um, and there was a lot of tears you know when, when certain schools would close but it, it's to be able to compete dollars are less that we have available to us in our operating budgets we had to make change and it was methodical and, and really if you look at JFK is the final piece of the of the remaking the enhancing of our of our school buildings and yes it comes at a cost we have assurances from the state of Connecticut and I know assurances are only as good as who is there today um, and decisions may be made but when we look at how the state has funded school building projects the money is set aside it's budgeted in the previous fiscal year we got our commitment papers into the state on time and we are told that we are locked in at the 70 percent reimbursement level um, this is the most economical project to undertake at jfk that we will ever have if we are going to redesign that school to make it meet our middle school needs for 40 years from now. Um, 
So I urge people to support it. Um, it's out on the refer on a on the ballot, so that you can ultimately have the decision. But if you're a taxpayer living in Enfield, this is the most economical decision by voting yes on JFK. Um, it will cost you so much more as a taxpayer in the future to do the same. Um, the work needs to be done. So we've done our job to get it to the voters. I'll be out there lobbying that I would ask you to vote yes for it. Anyone else? Sensing none, roll call please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Against. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's eight in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Next item is the resolution to submit to referendum the appropriation and bonding resolution for the expansion and renovation of John F. Kennedy Middle School. And this is another motion to waive the reading by Councillor Sakala, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Is there, okay, by show of hands, all those in favor of waiving the reading? Those opposed? How many were there? Everyone, you haven't voted yet. Are you gonna vote yeah, to waive? I'm, I'm, no, no, I wanna hear the reading. As he, long as there's six votes, that He's against the waiving of the reading. Waiving of the reading passes eight to one. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So by Councilor Second. Suzak, seconded by Councilor Arnone. <laughs> Discussion on this item? which is actually what it is, is it tells you what the question is. You got one. Um, so any discussion, Tom? So on, on the question again, and we, we've gone over this uh, and countless um, other referendums on the wording. Sometimes the wording is um, you know, very difficult to understand. This, this is, doesn't look terrible, but it's the best we can do, huh? So I will actually defer that question to Bond Council, Matt Ritter, who has oh, that graciously here? donated yeah, so his time this evening, either, presented Matt. himself I here no, to answer just no such a question. Here. <laughs> Come on up, Matt. I think he was here before, wasn't he? Yes, yes. yes. Hi, everybody, and good evening. Uh, uh, actually, I'm, I'm Matt Ritter from Shipman and Berlin in Hartford, and we serve as Bond Council, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with the town. And I was asked this question, I think, last year when I was here on yeah, that question. Probably. State statute does limit a little bit our ability to how the question is phrased. And it has to be in a question. It has oh. to be oh. Mike, 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 not on. The red, red button? I'm sorry about that. Sorry. It's okay. Do you want me to start over for you? Yeah, please. I do. Uh, Matt Ritter, Shipman and Goodwin, we're bond counsel to the town, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, again, the question needs to be uh, in yes or no form. Um, that's what the statute dictates in Title IX, and we have to make sure that it doesn't advocate. It can't be uh, too descriptive, and we try to do our best to make it as succinct as possible. You have to publish it. You have to put it on a ballot, so it's got to be short. And at the end of the day, there's two things we care about. The overall appropriation, even though the town's not paying for all of it, right, the voters have to say what the total appropriation is going to be. That's the $95 million figure. And then for us as bond council, we need the number that you cannot exceed for bonding. Uh, if we ever were to go short, for example, and go under what you needed, uh, we'd have to go back through the whole process again. We'd have to change the scope of the, the project. So we always want to have uh, what you guys think is the right handle on the amount of money you're going to need. And sometimes you go under, but it's a lot easier to go under than to go over. So. Right, and, that, and I guess that's that's always the part that is, uh, you know, it just doesn't say, you know, hammer home home to the av actual person reading it that, yep. you know, we're gonna, not going to exceed thirty five million. You know, it's it's a lot easier to say that, you know, you know, more simple language that we, you know, we're only going to bond thirty five million, and the state is going to pay the rest. I wish you could break it down that, you know, that. Uh, Precisely, but it's always been an issue with me that uh, no. uh, referendum questions are always confusing. <laughs> so I get the right to the source now and, yeah. and uh, blame you guys, but yeah. that's it. Yeah, and I, I, and I think you'd find uh, that many towns have the similar type of questions with the appropriation and the bond amount. But there is the explanatory text, which you're going to vote on, which can go to all the voters in the town. The town can mail it out as one of the exceptions to the rule about spending money prior to a re pending referendum. Uh, again, it's got to be neutral explanatory text. But in that paragraph, you'll see it does have a better breakdown to what you're talking about, Councilman. Yep. Gina? I just want to piggyback on what Tom said. So 
I guess what you're saying is by state statute, I, I believe you said it was state statute, that we can't put in there in parentheses or something, i.e., won't cost Enfield more than $35 million? Because that's, I think, honestly, I understand what it says, but it still doesn't make sense unless you read it three or four times and have, you know, have been hammered down your throats. And to be honest, I love the explanatory text that we're going to send out, but nobody's going to read it. Mm -hmm. I wish they did, but they're not going to. Um, so I guess my point is there's no way that we can put in there that it's not going to cost the taxpayers or the town of Enfield more than $35 million. Uh, again, I, I would be hard to draft that question, I think, in a succinct way, in a yes or no way as well, without making the question very long and cumbersome. And this is the way we've drafted questions for the town for a very long time. And I know just because we've done it previously doesn't make it right. But I've just never seen... In, in any of the work we've done, we work with a lot of communities around here, Manchester, Glastonbury, amongst others. I've never seen a question kind of phrased that way, and we do the best we can with the appropriation amount and the bond amount. I'm a big fan of parentheses. You can't put a parentheses in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll certainly go back and talk with my colleagues about it, and, and we can always try to make it better. But I, I understand the frustration from your side because you're trying to explain it to folks. But mm -hmm. from our perspective, when you look at charter compliance, statutory compliance, our ability to give a bond council opinion, our ability to put in offering documents to the rating agencies, we believe this is the, the best legal way to go about it. Ugh, the law. Yeah. Blame lawyers. it on the lawyers. <laughs> the lawyers. <laughs> Any further... So just one point, and Matt, if you can confirm this. So there's, you know, there's a big discussion about the state's financial condition. So, you know, we've been told we're at 70% reimbursement. But if something were to change mm -hmm. and the state was to all of a sudden say, oh, nope, it goes from 70 to 50, that would actually invalidate our referendum because we only allowed to spend up to or to bond up to the 35 five mm -hmm. so if if the reimbursement rate gets lowered for whatever reason then we don't have the funds to be able to spend on the project because we're only authorized to bond up to 35 five yeah and I, then we'd have to go back to another referendum to get voter approval to whatever it changed to. Right, you'd have to change the scope of the project, which in that case right. would probably be too massive to do that. And you'd have to go back for a supplemental appropriation yeah. uh, or other monies that could be available, but that would be unlikely to have that amount of money to cover right. it. Yep. Right. Okay. So, so in that case, you would it would just drop if we decided to just, you know, if, it, if something happened financially, yeah. um, it, it passed, um, and some calamity happened through the state, it would just be null and void. Or do uh, we have to go through a process to to avoid it? Yeah, and I don't. I, I not not to to try to be evasive of the question. It's an interesting question. It's a tough one. I don't know that it becomes null and void. It becomes very difficult for you to complete the project. Right. And remember, in the resolution, which I know you waived, which I would have too. But in the first paragraph, we cite a concept estimate and a study that's dated. And one of the reasons we like to do that in the resolution is the voters and you know what you're basing your vote off of, right? So you base it off of a 95 million dollar plan in this resolution. If the state reimbursement went down say 10, 15 million dollars, a big chunk of that project now, you don't have revenue you thought you're going to have for. And so I think you'd have to work with the town attorney, the town manager. We'd have to figure out how to approach that. I've never seen that happen. I think it was just said earlier here, uh, you would, if, that would, if that ever happened, it'd be multiple towns facing that problem. And interestingly enough, the legislature changed that statute about three years ago. It used to be you could not apply until you had all of the approvals in place. So the November 15th deadline you have now that allowed you to submit a June 30th, 2017 is a recent statutory change. And so it would be even further unfair to penalize a town for taking advantage of the new statutory language, which lets you submit and lock in at a rate as long as you approve it by November 15th of that year. Uh, that was not available to you four years ago. So it's a new change in particular. Yeah. Yeah. But you never know, as the mayor said, you'll have to. But we, I think you have to deal with that if the time came. Yeah. And he should know because... He's a legislator, yeah. too. <laughs> With his other hat. Yes. So, All right, Donna. I guess we need to reiterate what I just heard that we're hearing is that there's, there was statutory language change that this is a one-shot deal for everybody. It's not like in previous times where you could go back for a second referendum and it would be locked in. We're locked in in June. We need to pass in November. 
Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. So if if it if it failed, for example, and you went back next year, you don't have that that rate could possibly could be the same, but it would likely change. And you're you're locked in for this vote. You have till November fifteenth to have it approved. After that date, you you know all bets are off with construction services. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Anyone else? Matt, thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You appreciate you being it. here. Yep. And roll call, please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Against. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's eight in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution to authorize the town to prepare explanatory text and additional explanatory material for the referendum question. I think I can read this one. Be it resolved, section one, that in her discretion, the town clerk is authorized to prepare a concise explanatory text of the following appropriation and bonding resolution, which by vote of the town council has been submitted to a referendum vote on the voting machines of the town and the town manager is authorized to prepare additional explanatory materials regarding said resolution, such text and explanatory materials to be prepared in accordance with Connecticut General Statute Section 9-369B. Resolution to appropriate $95 million for the expansion and renovation of the John F. Kennedy Middle School and to authorize the issuance of bonds, notes, or temporary notes in an amount not to exceed $35,500,000 with the balance funded by grants and other available funds. So moved. By Councillor Arnone, Second. seconded by Councillor Denny. Discussion? Sensing none, roll call please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Against. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's eight in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution amending a lease agreement with the Educational Resources for Children, Inc. for use of various town-owned school facilities. Whereas on December 19, 2011, by resolution number 1626, the Enfield Town Council authorized the town manager to enter into a lease agreement with the Educational Resources for Children, ERFC, for the purpose of operating a before and after school program and four school facilities. Whereas the ERFC is interested in leasing space for the same purpose in two additional school facilities, namely one, Prudence Crandall Elementary School, to Edgar Parkman Elementary School. And whereas the Enfield Town Council desires to lease these additional spaces for the aforementioned purpose, and whereas Section 14 of the lease agreement provides that the lease may be amended at any time only by written amendment signed by lessor and tenant, and whereas proposed changes to the lease agreement are shown on attachment A and B attached here too, now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council does hereby authorize the town manager to sign the amendment to the lease agreement to include two additional spaces for the purpose of operating a before and after school program for children said lease agreement to otherwise remain in full force and effect. So moved. By Councillor Suzak, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Discussion? Sensing none. Roll call. Oh, Donna, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that now they're at every school, so it, uh, your priest, your three to five and your um, K to two are now at their schools where they can have the ERFC facilities without being bused. Any other? Roll call, please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Final item under miscellaneous discussion resolution non union pay plan. Whereas the town manager establish a policy and procedure for the purpose of conducting employee evaluations and awarding non-union merit increases, which was provided to the town council and all department and divi division heads of the town 
on or about October 20th, 2016. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 5, Section 14 of the Town Charter, the annual salaries and rates of pay for full-time and part-time non-union employees will be increased by 2% retroactive to July 1, 2017, based on employee performance from July 1, 2016 through June 30, 2017. This resolution includes the Chief, Deputy Chief, and Captains of the Enfield Police Department and the Director and non-union staff of EMS, but excludes the Town Manager and the Town Attorney. So moved. By Councilor Arnone. Seconded by Councillor Ludwig. Discussion? Mike? Uh, for the Mayor to Town Manager, any, and if you provide this, I apologize, but since I wasn't here in October, any chance we get a copy of what you provide in October? More than happy to. If you did already, I apologize. You might have sent it to me. But. <coughs> um, we'll be more than happy to get that uh, to you, Perfect. and we'll uh, expand on that at the next meeting on the 18th Perfect. as well. Anything else? Sensing none, roll call, please. Mayor Copen. Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Four. Councillor Prasadi? Four. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. Here's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. All right, that completes miscellaneous. Next item on the agenda is public communications. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? <coughs> Sensing none, councillor communications, any councillor communications? Sensing none, so I'll entertain a motion, motion to adjourn, adjourn by councillor Ludwig, seconded by councillor Suzak, by a show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? We are adjourned. Have a good night.